the House to consider legislation to create that department. The House is expected to take up the legislation tomorrow. Here's California Congressman David Dreyer chairing the meeting. Select Committee on Homeland Security and the Minority Whip, who has been the ranking minority member of the Select Committee on Homeland Security. And let me say to both of you and your members, congratulations for a fine job working through some extraordinarily difficult issues in an expeditious manner to meet the uh, goal that was first set forth, I know, by the minority leader when he said that he wanted this to be accomplished by September 11th. I know that we've uh, tried very hard, and it's been because of your efforts that we've been clearly moving in that direction. And um, I've had the privilege of working closely with both of you on a wide range of issues. And Mr. Army and I have just spent quite a bit of time this afternoon discussing this uh, measure, and I'm convinced that we will be able to fashion uh, a rule which will allow for the consideration of the major issues of concern that our colleagues have. So thanks to both of you. And I always say if there's prepared remarks, looks like you've got something there, Nancy. Without objection, they'll appear in their entirety in the record, and we'll welcome um, a summary. And uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Leader, we're happy to have you, and please proceed as you see fit. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, or Mr. Chairman, uh, sometime earlier in this day, I had with me on my person my prepared remarks. I have since misplaced them. When you find, I suspect they may be in a computer someplace, and we'll be happy to have them in the record right, here when you dig them up. Let, let me just make a few quick comments. First of all, let me say, for me personally, this was an extraordinary experience. I have, uh, during, throughout all the time that the Republicans have been in the majority, I have not served on a committee. So to have had the experience of, for the first time in my life, chairing a committee with the select committee uh, was extraordinary, in fact. We had a good committee. The members from both sides of the aisle were serious about their work and very respectful of the other committees. And I think it's something we should always keep in mind. Twelve committees. Standing committees of this House exercise jurisdiction over the President's pro original proposal. And that work was fully digested in our committee, uh, and uh, I think you will notice comprehensively integrated into the product that was finally reported from our committee. We had a lively day of examination of amendments and uh, vetted a lot of issues. I personally introduced two issues to, uh, in my mark, that uh, are retained in the bill that will come to the floor that are something controversial. One has to do with the manner in which we handle the ability of uh, people who supply to Homeland Security to uh, obtain coverage or somehow or another obtain uh, surcease from what can be their foreboding exposure to liabilities, uh, which could possibly be preemptive to their willingness to supply. There were two models by which that could be handled. One would be for the government to indemnify risk. The other would be to um, limit liability. You're, you will be familiar with these provisions. Uh, our committee went with the, the option to limit liability, if I may dare say, on the presumption that a victim of terrorism should not be treated in the courts as a perpetrator. Uh, but that is, make no mistake about it, a controversial matter that your committee will be asked to address, and you should address that, I think, in all fairness. Uh, another introduction that I made was to uh, extend the deadlines by which uh, our uh, airports in America, pursuant to the uh, a Transportation Safety Act must comply with such things as baggage control. This was very controversial. In that regard, I know that you have before you a request from Mr. Menendez. It is my recommendation that you honor his request relating that issue. That is, uh, it will be known by many of us, represents a direct conflict between the gentleman from New Jersey and myself, where in the final analysis I prevail. But I think every concept of fairness and fair process that we know in this building would say that without a doubt, the gentleman from New Jersey should have an opportunity to put his amendment on the floor. And when I make that recommendation, I dare say, I fear he will prevail. But I do think it would anything less than that would be unacceptable in our body, and it should be done. Uh, you will have a great many amendments. I would suggest that as you proceed, 
You try to sort through and eliminate duplications, I think you can, uh, you can minimize your task somewhat. And then finally, let me just say, by every agreement that we had that set up this select committee and this process with which to proceed, it has been understood that the speaker and the minority leader would, be, would present themselves before this committee and recommend a rule. I don't know whether they have done that or whether or not they have done that. But I do know this. Any recommendation that they make before this committee will be and should be given more weight than any recommendation I make. But I will, as I say that, still say, as a matter of personal privilege, let me again emphasize, I'd almost dare to say my insistence that you give Mr. Menendez that right to have that amendment on the floor. I don't think anything less of that could be construed as fair play. Thank you uh, very much for your testimony, Mr. Army. And let me say, as I uh, recognize the ranking minority member of the select committee, that both of you were very, very fortunate to have two extraordinarily able members of the Rules Committee, Ms. Price and Mr. Frost, as members of the select committee. And I know they both made very very helpful and beneficial contributions to the work product here that we uh, we are seeing, and uh, I suspect they might even have some questions for you. Ms. Pelosi. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm very pleased to appear before the Rules Committee and commend you and Mr. Frost and members of the committee for your stamina. Yes, we were very pleased to, I think I could speak for you in this regard, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Leader, both worlds. Uh, when I say how well served the select committee was by the service of Ms. Price and, and Mr. Frost and uh, at all of the members of the select committee, majority and minority. And our chairman was a gentleman throughout, although we had our disagreements, uh, he was never disagreeable. I, on the other hand, I can't, <laughs> I'll leave it up to him to decide. Mr. Chairman, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just would respond with one word, charming. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, I think it was J I forget. I know it was J.D. Salinger. I forget which book. I think maybe Franny and Zoe. He says in there, um, uh, or maybe Catcher in the Rye. I forget what, where he says. If I had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. I'm going to confine myself to my notes because that will keep it short. <laughs> but I will submit my statement for the record and try to be as brief as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm quite aware, as we all are, of the tremendous challenge we have as we, to reorganize government. Uh, and as ranking member of the Intelligence Committee, uh, I, I am very well aware of the threats we face from our enemies that make that reorganization so imperative. We have the responsibility to the fi families uh, of the victims of 9-11 uh, and, and, and that to all Americans, indeed. It was a terrible day. And when, as ranking member on intelligence, I met with the members of the family, some of the families affected, they tell us that, uh, they, they've told the members of the committee that even a plane flying overhead or the th another threat or warning just fills them with terror again. And of course, this is the goal of terrorist to fill people with terror to, and to terrorize a country into living a different way. We cannot let them have that victory. We must be a comfort to the families. I think this Department of Homeland Security uh, will take a giant step uh, in accomplishing that goal. We're all united in our determination to win the war against terrorism, and we know that we have to do that working together. There are some problems that we have, uh, some of us have, about the bill. Uh, that, uh, that was the mark that came out of our select committee last week. Some of us had hoped for a product that would have produced a, a, gov a, a department that would have been leaner, uh, more um, uh, it, it capable of making maximum use of information technologies. Uh, instead, I think the select committee put together an old-fashioned department, creating a huge, costly, and in some ways inefficient 1950s style government bureaucracy that will take years to pro function properly. Indeed, the GAO reported David Walker, controller of the GAO office, testified on July 17th to the subcommittee that for the new department to be fully effective, he suggests this process would take five to 10 years to provide meaningful and sustainable results. Those are his words. By retaining the president's plan to dismantle some of the civil service protections, I'm, uh, I'm 
I believe that the bill uh, undermines the ability of the new department to have the best possible workforce. The bill also provides broad exemptions from, new, from good government laws. Uh, the, these laws do not obstruct the war on terrorism, but do protect the traditions of open, accountable government, which I think are essential. Uh, I, I really salute my distinguished chairman and the majority leader uh, for his plea to this committee to allow Mr. Menendez or Mr. Oberstar, whoever uh, will be making the amendment uh, in regard to the extension of the deadlines for detection devices as far as explosives and baggage are concerned. Uh, the original uh, mark that we the, the proposal that we received from the majority on the day of the markup it gave an unlimited extension uh, for these detection of devices to be put in place. I think that was totally unacceptable. I myself opposed the uh, extension that was put there and salute him for uh, the fairness with which he has appealed to this committee to allow Mr. Mendez's amendment uh, to be in order. Uh, the, uh, many of the problems that are in the bill could have been avoided if we had taken more of the recommendations of the select committees. Most of these were bipartisan and unanimous. They were all bipartisan. Many of the recommendations uh, were unanimously um, uh, voted on in the committees and recommended to us. I think the chairman would agree. I, I don't know whether I'm calling you the chairman or the leader, but the chairman leader would agree uh, that one of the great days for Congress, and I hope Ms. Price and Mr. Frost would as well, was when the chairs and ranking members came before the select committee. It was a proud day for us because of the extent of their expertise, of the depth of their patriotism, and the uh, uh, persuasiveness of their appeal. Uh, throughout the process, um, it had been our understanding that there would be a rule that would, as, as the uh, leader said, uh, would be agreed upon by the speaker and the, majority, uh, the minority leader. And we had hoped that that rule would be as open as possible. So the plea from the leader about Mr. Menendez's amendment, I hope, is more than you would need uh, to have such an amendment made in order. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, in short, we're asking for this rule to be fair and open, uh, to provide for a fair and open process. We heard might, there might be a manager's amendment, Mr. Chairman. If so, I hope would we be able to make amendments to that, that that's not something we just see uh, tomorrow morning at, uh, after amendments may or may not, may no longer be uh, in order. So I hope that in the fair and open process that the committee provides, it gives ample time for amendments to the manager's amendment to be made. I remind the committee that the president gave us a 55-page bill. The chairman's mark was 218 pages. And then his manager's amendment was 19 pages the morning of the uh, markup. So if such an, uh, a manager's amendment were to, is on the horizon, literally, figuratively, in every other way, We'd like to be able to uh, see that so we can make amendments to it. The Home Manager uh, Security Department must have the confidence of the American people. The public must know that the best ideas proposed uh, in a bipartisan way ha have been well received and hopefully accepted. It must enjoy bipartisan support. We look forward, Democrats and Republicans, I'm sure, alike, to passing a bipartisan bill that protects our co country. That best way for that to happen is for us to have a fair and open rule. Thank you for your courtesy and for your attention to my concerns. Thank you very much you, to Chairman. both of you, and thanks uh, again for your fine service. Mr. Linder? Is it your, we have a couple of managers' amendments before us. Uh, is it your anticipation that that will be open for discussion with the uh, minority? I've indicated uh, to the speaker in, with respect to his negotiations, I indicated to the committee, I would prefer that variation of the manager's amendment that completes the uh, uh, process of extending uh, liability limits to the whole population of providers, that uh, there was a bit of an oversight in our committee work in that two uh, particular categories of providers were left out and should have been included. One would be those that provide uh, screening services at the airport and the other more broad category of people who provide uh, services to the uh, Homeland Security. Would that be all screeners? Uh, I, 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 yes. The, uh, th that extension of the liability provisions is the only difference between the two um, uh, versions you have before you. But there is there is some talk about a provision for for uh, protections from liability for certain screeners, not others. You know, one could uh, make that differentiation. I personally wouldn't be 
comfortable by saying, for example, if we were going to have some sort of decent uh, protection uh, against the excesses of the legal profession with respect to automobile manufacturers, I would not be comfortable to say, well, let's protect the Ford Motor Company product and leave the Chevrolet product out. I think that somehow or another would be discriminatory and unfair, even though the Sh Chevrolet product would probably be more in need of such protections. I, uh, I support that. Chris Chase has a modest proposal that seems to me should be in the manager's amendment that just encourages, it, it, it instructs the director of central intelligence to the maximum extent practicable to cooperate with the Department of the Secretary. Is that a problem for... Uh, Mr. Shays has brought that to my attention. I have it in my pocket. I'll go back and examine it. It is quite corollary to what is done with the, uh, uh, with the uh, investigations on drugs. Uh, it uh, seems... What is known as... Reasonable, doesn't it, to you? Drugs. It seems reasonable, but one has to be very careful about the... The, the legalities with a new agency like this, I don't want to just rush to any conclusion. My greatest fear in life is impulsively promising something that I later have to sort of reconsider. So I would rather reserve the right to think it through. Okay. Ms. Pelosi. Mr. Linder, if I may, as the ranking member on intelligence, uh, we proposed, and much of what we proposed for Mark Fitty, but not all, was accepted uh, by the chairman and his mark. And um, th this issue of cooperation from the intelligence agencies to, and in this case, the CIA, to the uh, department is a sensitive area. Uh, we had uh, retained for the president his usual prerogative to, uh, when there's certain sensitive information, especially involving sources and methods, that it would be his prerogative to um, insist that the, or declare that the Secretary of Defense, uh, Homeland Defense would have access to that information. We are in the middle of a joint inquiry into September 11th and the intelligence aspects of it. At the end of that inquiry, we will no doubt have more um, uh, informed recommendations, which I hope could be part of the package, and, and I know there will be other, even after this bill is signed into law, uh, other improvements that may be made on it and, and with uh, additional knowledge. Uh, but we had retained some of the discretion uh, to the president rather than making it a right of the chairman of the department, all recognizing fully that the uh, dissemin of dissemination of information was essential to mission success to protecting the American people. I just want to make one further point since the chairman addressed it. I'd be interested in seeing the manager's amendment, by the way, but uh, uh, just to get to the, the direct point, uh, the, ch and the chairman's mark, he gave total immunity. Uh, was it in mark or in your manager's amendment, the immunity, immunity? In one of the chairman's uh, legislative uh, vehicles, he gave total immunity on this uh, um, issue of, of uh, any liability. The, ch the committee, the, bi the bi uh, government reform committee, had passed in a bipartisan, I believe unanimous way, a recommendation uh, that I, had, I wish the chairman had accepted that has crossed the board support, had been worked on by the private sector uh, and the uh, members of the committee, and had the full support of the chairman of the Government Reform Committee. So I would hope that that amendment to put the, chair the committee's work, again, a product uh, acceptable to the private sector, uh, would be made, an amendment to, to put that into the bill would be made in order. I think it's a better, more reasonable, um, uh, and more contained liability for the federal government. But I share the chairman's view that we cannot have, uh, we have to do something about the liability issue. If I might build on something the gentlelady from California said, in the case of ag the Agriculture Committee and its jurisdiction, the Appropriation Committee and its jurisdiction, the Ways and Means Committee and its jurisdiction, the Transportation Committee and its jur jurisdiction, and the Intelligence Committee and its jurisdiction, uh, and perhaps others I can't remember off the top of my head. The Select Committee, by and large, took a, the exact comprehensive agreement that was worked out by those separate individual committees and the administration, uh, pretty much as was, and, and pretty much sustained those agreements because they are, as the general lady says, oftentimes complex and delicate. That represented, I thought, a fairly comprehensive acceptance of the work of the standing committees, contrary to what you heard just a minute ago. Furthermore, it is sometimes difficult for me to uh, 
comprehend what the gentle lady from California means and the characterizations she gives to my work, so sometimes it's not really possible for me to respond to the points she raises because well, I just don't understand yield. the language she uses. Will the very distinguished gentleman yield? In the most nonpartisan way I can. <laughs> Thank you. The gentleman uh, uh, rightfully states that he did accept the work of the Ag Committee, the Ways and Means Committee. Indeed, these committees had a teeny part uh, and uh, appropriations a larger part of the mark. The transportation the committee, uh, certainly the, uh, the chair and ranking of that committee uh, perhaps have already testified, but a large they, they part, have, they have large not, part uh, of their recommendation... Mr. Oberstar is here anxiously the awaiting the A large part of their recommendation was not taken, and government reform which is, of course, the Committee of Jurisdiction for much of this information, from much of this uh, uh, legislation is not, most, most of their work was not accepted by the committee. But we're looking to the future. We want to see a fair and open process where the House of Representatives will work its will <laughs> so that the product that goes forth has that full legitimacy, and it's up to the Rules to, Committee to provide that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One more question. Uh, Mr. Leader, um, as you know, there's an issue in Georgia about the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center program. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman from Savannah has a couple of amendments here. One is to not move it from Treasury mm -hmm. to Justice. The other is to keep it in its location so it doesn't wind up being moved off to West Virginia or South Carolina. Um, I'm not sure who made the, put the language in the bill to move it. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand there's been a lot of conversations between the Chairman of the Judiciary Committee and you and others. Um, would, if, if the second amendment that he proposes, which is to say, at whatever you, wherever you put it, I think a senator is intending to put it in Homeland Defense, mm -hmm. your bill puts it in Judiciary, if an uh, amendment is put forth and, and made in order for it to at least keep the at least keep the uh, location where it is and the people there are. Would you have any opposition to that? I just say that um, you're referring to the Kingston, uh, uh, two, Mr. Kingston had two amendments. Uh, the uh, provisions that he's trying to amend were accepted on behalf of the committee, I believe Judiciary Committee, uh, and Mr. Kingston offered two amendments. We recommended to the speaker in his discussions with the minority leader that the second of the Kingston amendments, that's which defined uh, the full comprehensive activities of the agency would be clearly stipulated to be retained. It would be language comparable to that which we put in on behalf of FEMA and uh, that which we also put in, very much authored by the chairman of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee on behalf of the Coast Guard. So we thought that that Kingston offering was uh, a very good improvement and recommended it to the speaker in his discussions. I would recommend it to this committee. Thank you. As I said, I know that the uh, members of the select committee certainly have questions, and Mr. Frost has informed me that he has several questions, so I'm happy to recognize him now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to uh, congratulate both uh, the chairman and the ranking member for the hard work that they put in on this uh, project. Uh, Mr. Army, uh, Mr. Womp from Tennessee has an amendment that he has submitted to us. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I am familiar. Uh, this would, of course, establish an additional criteria um, for, the, for the secretary to consider when selecting colleges or universities as centers for homeland security. This additional criteria would be affiliation with Department of Energy laboratories. This amendment, of course, would exclude every single university and college in the state of Texas if it were to be adopted. And he has asked that this be included in the manager's amendment. I can't imagine that you would put this in the manager's hmm. amendment. Well, what we try to do with all of these criteria, I think right now I forget what it is, something like uh, 12 to There 15, were 17 17 originally. criteria. If the criteria was consistent with what we saw the mission uh, of uh, the uh, Homeland Defense Agency, we thought it was a legitimate criteria. Uh, I have agreed with Mr. Womp that I would con continue to work with him, examine that, and see to the possibility of it being considered perhaps in a conference later, but I, my own personal view is that it needs more work before it should be considered in, at this time. So it would not be in the manager? It will not be in the manager. I, I'm pleased to hear that. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Army, I have a couple of other questions. Um, you've already testified uh, at some length 
about the liability provisions mm -hmm. and the indemnity provisions. Um, I offered and submitted an amendment to this committee um, to strike those provisions. Uh, I am withdrawing my amendment at this mm -hmm. time from consideration, but I would urge, however, that this committee make in order the Davis-Turner Amendment, bipartisan amendment, submitted by Tom Davis, a Republican, and Jim Turner, a, a Democrat. This amendment, of course, would simply restore the language on, in, on indemnification that was reported out by the Government Reform Committee, and I would urge that that be included. Uh, you've been very kind to say that you would uh, urge this committee to include the Overstar Menendez Amendment, which addresses the baggage screening issue, and I would hope that uh, this, uh, the, the Republican leadership would also urge this committee to uh, make in order the da bipartisan uh, Davis-Turner Amendment on this subject so we could have a vote on the issue. You, you correctly have, have mm -hmm. stated to the committee that there is a difference of opinion, a legitimate difference of opinion. Uh, you view this one way. The Government Reform Committee viewed it another way. Your, your view prevailed in the Select Committee, and I would urge that we give Mr. Davis and Mr. Turner the same opportunity on the floor that we apparently are going to give Mr. Overstar and Mr. Menendez on their particular subject. Well, I would obviously, and is, of course, the, uh, the, uh, within the jurisdiction of this committee. I would not join you in urging the committee to that inclusion. And uh, I, mean, I just, I'm just tell you, call it the way I see it. I, I understand. This, this, this would at least offer the choice between the original committee provision mm -hmm. that was rejected by our select committee and the provision that was included by our select yeah, committee. The, uh, the Davis-Turner issue relative to my issue of limit liability limitations, these, these go down to foundation philosophical differences between people as opposed to the other issue where I appeared to be so much more considerate and generous, which was uh, uh, a question of technique and matter of process by which we accomplish a similarly embraced goal. Um, my view is the indemnification thing is... Uh, should not be an acceptable public policy posture in terms of the exposure that it, it presents for the American taxpayer, and I feel quite strong about that. Well, uh, Mr. Army, you certainly have the opportunity to argue that point on mm -hmm. the floor if we make an amendment mm -hmm. in order, if we have a clear choice between mm -hmm. the indemnification and the liability limitations, and who knows, you might prevail if you made that oh, argument I, on the no floor. I have no doubt about that, I might, but I, and, and I would say to the gentleman from Texas, you obviously are exercising your right to advise this committee to take into consideration and make available for floor debate a position that is acceptable to you. I feel more uh, equally duty-bound as just in terms of the foundation of who I am and what I believe America is all about to advise this committee, please don't expose America to such a risk. Of course, I this mean, was the provision. That is the difference of opinion we talk about. Yes, that was the provision. That, the provision that I'm advocating is the one that was reported out of the Committee of Jurisdiction. It's and not the really, Committee of it's Jurisdiction. It's not really my view. It's the view of the Committee of Jurisdiction. The Committee of Jurisdiction was wise on very many things, but they were not wise in that case, in my estimation. I mean, that's the difference we talk about. Right, if I may ask you a, a, another question, um, and, and I'm trying to touch on the major issues that this committee has to deal with. Um, knowing I will not reach all of them, but mm -hmm. I'm trying to touch on some of the major ones. On the uh, personnel issue, uh, on the civil service uh, issue, um, Mr. Waxman has an amendment that I've joined in with, uh, with him on. It's mm -hmm. uh, Waxman Frost number 95. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, again, would attempt to reinstate the position of the Government Reform Committee that they reported out. Uh, we didn't adopt the, provision, the position of the Government Reform Committee on this subject. We chose to adopt uh, a provision offered by another member uh, of, our, uh, of our select committee, as you know, a gentleman from Ohio. And uh, I'm not speaking here to the Morello Amendment. I'm setting aside the issue mm -hmm. of the Morello Amendment. But uh, I am suggesting that we make in order the, the Waxman Amendment which would restore all the other provisions reported out unanimously by the Committee of Jurisdiction uh, instead of the provision that we included as a substitute for the provision that we included in our uh, select committee work. Would you have any objection to Mr. Waxman having the opportunity to offer that on the floor? Well, uh, I have already indicated in my discussions with the Speaker and, 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 and I would say to this committee, I would, 
I would think it would be appropriate for the committee to allow that amendment on the floor. I think Mr. Portman has a second degree amendment request he would make in that regard. I would not put it in the category uh, that I do the Menendez amendment. Uh, I'm not as willing to be so generous on that since I see the Waxman uh, Frost Amendment to be a partisan position as opposed to the, the manner in which I view the, Men the Menendez position. But I would certainly say to this body, uh, I can understand how it would be considered a fair and open process to accept that amendment in the rule and make it available for discussion on the board. I appreciate the gentleman's uh, answer. Uh, the other question on that regard is the Morella Amendment. And uh, that this is a separate from the Waxman Amendment. The Morella Amendment, as we know, was adopted by a very narrow vote in the Committee mm -hmm. of Jurisdiction, 21 to 19. Uh, Mrs. Morella is going to, is here and presumably will be testifying before this committee, asking that she have the opportunity to offer her amendment on the floor, uh, member of your own party. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have any objection to her right to offer that amendment? Oh, I, in fact, recommend that we do. I think it's a very principled position that she takes, and I think this committee ought to respect it in every way. I uh, thank you. Uh, and I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't mean to I disagree to with it, by the way. But right. I didn't mean to exclude the ranking member from this, but I was trying to to get uh, Mr. Ar Mr. Army on the record on, an, on a variety of I'm subjects. Very pleased. I understand Mr. Frost and yeah. uh, Mr. Uh, Army wrote the bill, and uh, the bill came out uh, five to four, although we right. had hoped to have uh, a unanimous bipartisan vote. And uh, I hope that uh, respectful of the uh, uh, deeply believed convictions that the, the leader has, that the committee will be open on the subject of the immunity issue, uh, and get, whatever your your own view is on it, give the House the opportunity to work its will. And I wish to submit for the record on that score a letter from the Reserve Officers Association of the United States, which um, is delighted that we are forming an Office of Homeland Security, but strongly uh, opposes uh, the Section 753. And it says, uh, we believe the 753 subtitle F, which is the title in question about the immunity, is inconsistent with pursuing the highest quality products for use by our armed forces as they fight terrorism. This is the, the liability This issue. is the mm. liability provision. It, it will get what to that. What you're saying is immunity. Furthermore, uh, the provision unfairly and necessarily erodes protections that our servicemen and women have enjoyed for half a century. Under the section, the Secretary will be able to immunize from civil liability any product deemed anti-terrorism technology. We are dismayed to learn that this immunity could even be extended to a contractor guilty of willful misconduct, even holding out the possibility that a contractor might be immunized for willful misconduct creates a disincentive for the private sector to pursue quality solutions to our nation's challenges. At a time when Americans, can, American trust of the, uh, well, it, it's too long yeah. and I, the committee has been patient, I'll just submit uh, this Without letter for the record. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could, uh, Mr. Chairman, please, I will wrap up, as, wrap up as, as quickly as I can. Uh, Mr. Army, uh, this committee will be uh, meeting for a while longer this evening. Uh, Bless your heart. It is uh, uh, possible, I guess, that we will report a rule out oh, sometime we, this oh, evening. Oh, yes, we will. Before right, 7, I hope. Or it is possible that we could come back in the morning and report out a rule, as we have done on some occasions. Uh, we're planning to report the rule out sometime mm -hmm. in the next several hours. I, I would hope that would be the case. Uh, do you anticipate that, and I'm asking you in your capacity as majority leader at this point, um, do you anticipate that this bill will be concluded on the floor in one day, that is the day of Thursday, or do you anticipate that it might spill over to Friday? No, I, I, may I pr thank you for that question. May I make a plea to the committee? I know it's, you, you, I don't want to get too detailed in my request here, but if I can switch my hat to majority. It is my anticipation that we would spend most of tomorrow, we have a few other things we want to get done, and Friday on that. But I'm also cognizant of the number of members who have already made family plans, particularly the family plans they've made. And as you structure the rule and you have an opportunity to assign time dimensions and so forth, if you could perhaps be mindful that how you structure that affects our ability to wrap our, our business at, say, every respectable time on Friday. My, and if I can just leave it with this impression, it is my belief and my impression that all the members of this body 
would look on all of us as having achieved the highest degree of quality of workmanship if they were heading for their airplanes by 6 o'clock Friday night. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be a goal consistent with their plans that maybe you could assist us on. Obviously, you're going to have other more important considerations. Uh, I think that uh, uh, our colleagues would place that second to us coming out with the highest quality Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we, this is very important. We are moving quickly on the calendar. We don't have to move so quickly on the clock. Uh, we should have a fair and open debate so the product is legitimate and we, the public understands why we made the decisions uh, that we have made. So I hope that the committee will balance uh, the, the uh, safety yeah. of our country that I know, I know, I can speak for you in this regard, Mr. Leader, yeah. that you hold as your top priority. Yeah. You spoke so magnificently to that point in uh, our committee. Yeah, and I wouldn't have put my request as a top priority, but I hope it would be a consideration that you might be able to give your I comments. would only observe to the, to the members here that as a member with 24 years' experience in this body, I never make flight reservations on the day that we are scheduled to leave. I always have a flight the next day. Yeah, I, if I may just cop a plea, I have the uh, <laughs> flight reservations made for the 25-year overdue honeymoon trip to Niagara with my wife. At what time? At what time? <laughs> Saturday morning. Saturday, Saturday morning. Yes, that's uh, that's uh, right. Uh, and, and if Not I could, Saturday in a sense afternoon, I'm pleading for my life. If, if I if I could uh, follow up, please proceed. Mr. Frost has follow further up, do, questions. Do I assume that the gentleman then is suggesting to this committee that when we make amendments in order, that we set a time limit for the consideration of each amendment? It may not be the same amount of time for each amendment, but that we have a definite right. period of time in the rule for the consideration. Let me just say, if, if tomorrow morning I had such a rule in my hand, I could sit down, deconstruct that rule against the clock, and tell members mm -hmm. with some degree of reliability, you can expect to make a flight at such and such a time. Now, whether that be Saturday, uh, or Sunday or whatever, obviously the considerations mentioned by Ms. Pelosi are more important mm -hmm. than the member's travel arrangements. I think every member understands that. But insofar as it is possible to get to some fine tuning that accommodates to the member's desires, my wife, incidentally, after 18 years, has learned with good humor to not count on any promise made <laughs> by a member of Congress to a spouse. And, and I, would, uh, I would only urge the gentleman to be sure and take a ride on the Maid of the Mist we, when, uh, when he goes to We have that plan. Uh, I, I get very no romantic question. when I'm Thank with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Frost. Ms. Price. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to begin uh, by saying um, what an honor it was to serve uh, with this distinguished committee and um, what an honor it was for all of us to hear from so many dedicated, knowledgeable, selfless public servants um, that gave of their time and their expertise, uh, the, not the least of which was our, our committee chairman and our ranking members. And um, the fact that all work together so well under such short uh, time constraints um, for the good of this cause uh, was uh, a sight to behold. And I also would like to take this opportunity to um, congratulate the chairman leader for his statesman-like demeanor throughout the entire process um, and his patience with all of us. Um, it was um, a very gracious and um, professional way he handled um, some very delicate issues, and so I just want to congratulate both of you um, for a job well done. We had to make very difficult decisions. We will face many difficult decisions again tomorrow. This is a process. Our select committee did its job, uh, and it was not an easy job, but we got through it, and it's not the end of the road, though. Uh, we will finish our work as uh, a body um, by Friday. I would like to... Uh, perhaps get some clarification and, and um, from for my own benefit and for, for the benefit of anybody who is, is listening, but the letter that um, Ms. Pelosi read from described um, our, what I believe is limited liability and she referred to it as immunity. Now, I don't, I don't believe, it's my understanding this is just a limit on punitive damages. Is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Leader, okay. And that is in no way immunity. Well, um, that's why I was so confused and had no idea what it was the gentlelady lady was talking about. All right. And so uh, a limit on punitive damages in the eyes of terror mm -hmm. 
um, I think is is a very legitimate thing that we could consider. I should mention we have the, uh, already have these limitations in place, for example, for the New York Port Authority, for the uh, leaseholders of the Twin Towers, and for many other people that American Airlines that were, whose planes were taken. So what we're saying here is let's let's understand the quality of impact that makes on our very ability to supply to the process. Uh, our largest concern is people who might otherwise have uh, uh, material equipment, ideas, technology, who would be deterred by an excessive overexposure as over and against an underability to uh, ensure from providing for this nation's defense. Uh, I think there's a reasonable burden. The idea that somebody who, who is themselves a victim of, uh, of uh, terrorism being exposed to punitive damages is in, on its face, in my estimation, ludicrous. And, and I agree with that. Ms. Pelosi, did you want to? Yes, uh, since uh, the letter was not clear to you, I'll read on. Uh, and this might make it clear to both the distinguished chairman and leader and uh, the gentle lady uh, who served so well on the select committee and inspired us so with her not only her ideas, but her beautiful expression of patriotism, and we were all uh, inspired by that, and I speak sincerely in that regard to uh, Congresswoman Price. The, uh, further expressing the concerns of the Reserve Officers Association of the United States, and an example that would be illustrative and perhaps uh, uh, clarify the matter in a way that their the previous paragraphs did not. Our concern for, and I quote, our concern for military personnel derives from the fact that under the Ferris Doctrine, service members cannot sue the government for injuries suffered while on active duty. We all know that. However, even under this doctrine, servicemen and women have a right to sue third-party contractors who injure them. Section 753 would abolish that right. Under Section 753, the families of military personnel who die because of the willful misconduct, fraud, or gross negligence of a contractor would receive no compensation for the loss. The contractor would walk away scot-free. If you want me to read on, I will. Well, I would, but check, that the, is the I would check the letter the for technical accuracy in its understanding of that section of the bill. I would suggest that uh, whoever wrote the bill, wrote the letter, had not first read the bill. But would the gentleman then be saying that these service members would have uh, uh, access I to I would read the law. third parties? I think, yeah. Just in your knowledge of the bill that you wrote, would you be contending here that they are incorrect in saying would, that servicemen and yes, women would, would not have the right to sue third party uh, Yes, I would, I would say that this letter is inaccurate. Okay, so you're saying that under your bill, third party uh, servicemen and women would have the right to sue third party contractors. I don't think my bill even speaks to that issue. Mm -mm. Well, um, perhaps the gentleman doesn't understand his bill because that <laughs> is what the immunity would do. Well, and reclaiming my time. One of the things about the gentle lady's charm that so enamors her to me is her presumption of my unlimited patience <laughs> with your needling. And my uh, saying that the gentleman was. Uh, Endlessly, a gentleman is obviously running its course as well. But I would say, yeah, I, I would like to reclaim my time because, um, if I just may say though that obviously this needs more debate and clarification. I hope the rules committee would allow for. Uh, I have no other questions, but I just would refer the the gentle lady to the bill itself as opposed to uh, a third party's interpretation of it. And we have the author with us here, and I would certainly. Um, uh, take his rendition of what the intent behind it is before um, someone that we have not heard from officially. And with that, I yield thank back. You thank you. Well, thank you. First, I want to, I want to thank the uh, majority leader and the minority whip for their uh, long and hard work on, on this committee, and we all appreciate it. Um, and um, there are a lot of good things in this bill, and there are some things that uh, some of us on, 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 on this side uh, have some concerns with. Um, I want to say to the Majority Leader that I'm grateful uh, for his uh, endorsement of allowing the menendez Obastar language to, to, uh, to be, part of, uh, be, be part of the debate, because a lot of what we are talking about in this committee to the viewing public uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but the one thing that does is secure airports, uh, and, um, and I think uh, having a debate on whether we should extend the deadline for a year to uh, install 
uh, protective screenings, uh, baggage screenings uh, in our airports, I think is something that uh, people know, care about, and uh, it's a meaningful issue. So I appreciate I appreciate that. I also appreciate the gentleman's. Uh, uh, endorsement of allowing uh, there to be uh, uh, debates on some of these worker protections, uh, protection issues, uh, the Waxman-Frost uh, legislation. Um, Ms. Schakowsky has a, has a provision on, uh, on uh, FOIA and um, on protecting whistleblowers, and I hope that those will be made in order, too. I mean, one of the things I really believe strongly about is part of Homeland Security uh, needs to need, also needs to be to attract the best and the brightest to be working in these departments, and that means good, strong worker protections uh, in place. Um, uh, I, I just I just have a couple of just general questions. Uh, uh, I, I, I understand that the Congressional Budget Office uh, has increased its estimate cost of implementing the Homeland Security Department legislation from three billion dollars last week to four point five billion uh, after analyzing the bill before us today. Um, this amount, according to CBO, and I quote, does not reflect the amount of additional spending that may be necessary to prevent terrorist attacks, reduce the nation's vulnerability to attacks, and recover from any, any attacks, end of quote. Um, I guess my question is, are, are you concerned about the cost uh, and the size of the proposed new department? Uh, do you believe that, the, uh, that it will be effective as, as, you, as you have proposed it? I mean, both. First of all, I'm always concerned about the cost. One of the things that I had hoped and one of the things that I think is possible is that as we consolidate all these agencies into, the, in, into one uh, position under the one secretary, that we should be able to duplicate some uh, or eliminate some duplications. I am told by the White House and encouraged consistently by the White House and offices of the White House that if they get the flexibility that they hope to have in this, in that reorganization effort, they can probably cover those costs that are projected by uh, CBO. One would, one would expect that to be the case. There's, I mean, for example, you wouldn't necessarily have to have, what, 14 separate personnel offices and some of these support activities. So you should be able to make, obtain some savings. How large they would be relative to that, I don't know. But I do know this. We're talking about securing the safety of this great nation and within reason, we need to be willing to accept some cost. Ms. Uh, Mr. McGovern, uh, I certainly am disappointed to hear that the costs have increased from $3 billion, which was, seemed huge, to now $4.5 billion for the transition cost. But it, it gives me an opportunity to, to suggest to the distinguished chairman, ranking member, and members of the committee another amendment that we hope will be made in order, and that is to um, the committee uh, accepted a version of the uh, codifying the Office of Homeland Security in the White House. What we would like our amendment to do, Mr. Chairman, is to uh, strengthen that office in a stronger amendment that was accepted by the committee, so that in this five to ten years that it will take, uh, GAO is saying that it will take for this large department to be up and running, that we will have a, st a strong codified Office of Homeland Dis uh, Security government-wide to protect the American people. And that as this Department of Homeland Community, uh, Security comes together and perhaps even adds other entities or subtracts some as, as they prove their ability to work together, uh, that this office in the White House will be protecting the American people from day one, from signature day uh, of this bill. We, Thank we, you, Mr. McGovern. Yeah, we, we were told this morning, this afternoon by somebody that over 100 agencies uh, which have some responsibility for Homeland Security are not included in the proposal. And I, I guess my question, because um, both of you have, were the leaders on this bill, uh, you know, does the proposed legislation have sufficient mechanisms and coordination uh, of, the work, of the work of these agencies? My estimation it does. We've studied on this very hard. Some of the relationships we had with, for example, in terms of the uh, client relationship and the tasking uh, relationships between FBI and, and secret, uh, CIA were very difficult for us, but always hard to tell if you got the exact right formula, but we've had uh, 12 standing committees of the House working as over and against the recommendations of the White House and then, of course, the final judgments of the select committee. It seems to me we've got it about as close as we would dare to hope we'd be able to do. Um. Briefly, uh, the committee, obviously, the department will not uh, have jurisdiction over all of those agencies. That's why the, depart the Office of Homeland Security in the White House 
uh, must be a strong office because it would have, as I said before, government-wide uh, jurisdiction to coordinate activities uh, which would have anything to do with protecting the American people from terrorism. To reduce risk uh, and to protect the American people while protecting their civil liberties is a goal. Our chairman has been a champion on the civil liberties issue. I have to, uh, I don't want the evening to go by without making that statement. And, Thank and, you, and, and just my final question, Ms. Ms. DeLauro was here earlier um, arguing on behalf of her amendment, which uh, she offered in, in, the, com in the committee, um, basically uh, saying that uh, these uh, expatriate companies that leave, uh, that at least on paper, leave the United States to avoid paying U.S. taxes shouldn't be the beneficiaries. Uh, of some of these uh, government contracts, these homeland security uh, contracts. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I think and she makes a pretty good case that, you know, in this time of, of, of war, when all of us are being asked to, to make, sa when, every, when everybody in the country is being asked to pay sac uh, make sacrifices and, you know, hardworking men and women are paying their, their taxes and, and some of these special big corporate interests are not, you know, why should they be the beneficiaries of, uh, you know, of, uh, of government contracts. And wh wh regardless of where, you, where you are on the issue, I mean, would you, would you also endorse uh, the, uh, the, the idea of allowing that uh, to be at least debated on the floor and, um, you know, in, in this new spirit of openness? And Let me just say that one of the most enjoyable things for me personally in this experience has been working with Ms. Delora. And there could be nothing that I would feel more sincerely than the sincere wish and hope that I have that Ms. Laura win an amendment and, g and gain a lot of pats on the back. I mean, uh, she's such a delightful person. So, I, so does I, that mean you want to give her the opportunity? But not this amendment. <laughs> <laughs> and unhappily, this seems to be the nature of our relationship. I consider this nation to be superfluous, misguided, unnecessary, and an intrusion of politics into an otherwise serious subject. And I regret that it's offered by Ms. Laura. I would like to support uh, the inclusion of the consideration of the DeLauro Amendment. Uh, it has as much place uh, in this bill as uh, Mr. Armey's uh, provisions about indemnification because we're speaking to uh, depriving the right to bid for contracts to countries who have cho uh, companies who have chosen uh, profit over patriotism, and it would seem a shame to allow them to benefit, benefit from uh, the... Uh, contracts on homeland security while fleeing the coop when it comes to paying taxes to paying for the uh, for that freedom and that security. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the gentlewoman's comments, and I hope that uh, that this committee will make that that amendment in order. Uh, you know, um, you know, I, I regret that the uh, that the majority leader views it as simply a political amendment, but uh, you know, I, I, there is legitimate outrage over the fact that uh, there are some uh, interests in this country that are not paying their fair share. Um, and uh, especially during these difficult times, I think people uh, people are demanding that uh, that at least in this body that we uh, that we act accordingly and that we try to reel in people who are not playing by the rules. That people want fairness. So uh, I appreciate your work, and um, and I hope we have an opportunity to debate this amendment on the floor. Mr. Diaz Villar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I join all of uh, my colleagues in. Uh, uh, thanking uh, the majority leader and the minority whip and uh, all the members of the select committee for their very hard work and devotion. Uh, I'm cognizant of the uh, historic nature of what we're doing and, of course, of its importance uh, and need as well. Uh, both of you have been very strong supporters of uh, legal immigration uh, and uh, are um, aware of the wonderful contributions to the nation of immigrants and uh, uh, as as this effort moves forward and uh, the nation's security is uh, increased uh, I know that both of you uh, uh, are uh, supportive of uh, making certain that uh, uh, the rights of legal, legal immigrants are protected uh, and the Executive Office of Immigration Review, which is the, uh, the, the Office of the Immigration Lawyers, they, they, they do wonderful work. Um, and um, uh, they are concerned. I don't really know, and, I'm, and I'd like to know if 
the status of, of, of that office uh, in, in the new uh, in the legislation um, because the immigration judges are concerned that their uh, independence uh, may not be sufficiently uh, protected if they're thrown in uh, along with uh, immigration with the INS in the new department uh, and so I would like to ask uh, you about the status, and uh, I know this is a fluid issue that hasn't uh, ultimately been decided, but uh, I was wondering if you could give us a, a bit of an overview on the status and uh, perhaps a, uh, a view with regard to where you think this issue will end up, and I know uh, that uh, I'm sure that you also are, are cognizant of the concerns of the immigration judges. Well, uh, if I may, the uh, fascinating part of this issue was that I am very convinced in my own mind, although I've not been told this explicitly, that when the president first began to prepare his thoughts about this agency, the Homeland Defense Agency, one of the things they did was have early discussions with the State Departments and work out an agreement between the White House and the State Department about how visa, uh, visa issuance would be handled and other immigration issues would be handled. And despite what I saw to be the very strong feelings of very key, highly placed members of the committees of jurisdiction, the thing that I thought was most amazing was how that agreement survived through the Judiciary Committee, the International Relations Committee, and finally also in the Government Operations Committee. So of all of the agreements that were made by principal uh, agencies of the government, that proved to be the most durable against some of the most uh, what should I say, passionate resistance. Our committee honored that. We pretty well have that. Now, there are a few other little details up, up and on in the particular office that you talk about. It's not something I can give you off the top of my head. But I do think that we've done a fairly decent job here of honoring the work that has been done. And the uh, uh, in the committees, largely cog cognizant of and what should I say, incorporating the prior negotiations between very important uh, departments of the federal government. It's quite fascinating to watch that process as it went through these three committees. Mr. Diaz Bellard, just one quick point. I think that you would have been edified to hear the testimony of Mr. Sensenbrenner, Mr. Hyde, and Mr. Lantos, Mr. Sensenbrenner from Judiciary and Mr. Hyde and Lantos from International Relations in response to a question of our leader about the um, uh, status, uh, the regard that the status of uh, non-immigrants, non, excuse me, non-citizens in the United States. Uh, should, in light of terrorism, there be a distinction made in terms of rights, et cetera, attributed to pe persons in the United States who are not citizens? And they uh, spoke with such eloquence, patriotism, and and uh, knowledge about how that would be uh, that would be wrong to do to go down that path, and that the Constitution applies equally to every person uh, in our country. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I also want to thank you for um, what you have done and. Um, putting this together and all the committees who have spent hundreds of hours literally making this happen. I think we all realize and, and accept the seriousness of this. And um, I would hope that just because we're doing this at night, um, people don't get the idea that we're rushing this through. And this is not something that has had a tremendous amount of effort put into it. And so I just wanted to make that point and thank you all for the work you've done to um, make this happen. Well, if I may just make the observation, Mr. Chairman, the, the nomenclature of terrorism, they always like to believe they own the night, but here in our body, we know the Rules Committee owns the night. So we are in good hands with your work tonight. Mr. Sessions. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I just have three quick uh, statements that I'd like to give to the Majority Leader for his uh, hard work. Number one, I, I am very proud of the uh, language that you put in that extends the airline baggage screening. I am very concerned about uh, the deadline that has been forced upon uh, not only TSA but also the uh, airports and would note that at least um, an airport in close to my district, DFW Airport, has submitted their plan to TSA and with great respect to TSA, they're very, very busy but have not had a chance to even approve that. And I believe it would be unwise 
for us to proceed something when we know, in fact, that it could not be done. My questions are very uh, succinct. I'd like to know, I've, one of the amendments we're dealing with, Majority Leader, is uh, Dr. Ron Paul, number 34, prohibits the development of a national identification system or card. And can you discuss, is there something in this bill that talks about a national ID card? Yeah, there's a specific prohibition in the bill. So it, against that. Yeah, so this is, uh, there is a, uh, you usually hear about it, you'll read about it uh, in the editorial pages as the, uh, the TIPS program, the, but the language that uh, prohibits the implementation of the TIPS program also uh, prohibits the implementation of a national uh, uh, identification card. And Ron Paul's amendment, while I appreciated the position that he took, my recommendation is that it is not necessary by virtue of the language already in the bill. Good. The last point that I would make, and it's uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may just speak to that point for a second, just to, to add to what the chairman said, I would hope that uh, I appreciate the language the chairman put in the bill about the tip prohibition on the tips program, but I would hope that no such program under any name would be implemented that would carry out uh, the, the purpose of a tips program, and that the uh, uh, prohibition on a national identity card would include mm -hmm. a national driver's license as well. Well, I think, if I may, I think that language covers all that ground. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lastly, to ask the advice of the uh, gentleman from Texas about what is known as T-Hart Amendment Number 76 attaches the provisions of the Army and Pilots Against Terrorism Act. I am very much in favor of this. <clears throat> adding it to this bill, but I'm interested in your opinion. I, I, again, I think you, you all want to make your judgment on it. My own view is I think we've covered that in other legislation. I'm not sure that it's necessary to add it here. I have no aversion to add it here, but, but I would probably not recommend that we do, just because I don't believe it's necessary to add it here. I thank the gentleman. Thank you both very much, and thank you for the hard work. You, you produced the product, and and a record time and, and, a, and a good product, and uh, you're to be congratulated. Thank you. It is now in order for us to continue a panel that was at the table when we were interrupted uh, at roughly 7 o'clock. Ms. Maloney, Mr. Shays, Mr. Turner, and Ms. Shikowsky, please pull some. Putnam, are you part of this panel? Welcome. Pull chairs up, please. Just pull some chairs up. Okay. Mr. Cummings, are you part of this panel, too? Are you part of this panel? Well, find a chair. Yeah. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Mr. Chairman? Can I... I mean, given the fact that the, these people have uh, were here at 7 and they, they've now come back, can I ask unanimous consent that whatever amendments they want be made automatically in order? <laughs> Give it for their patience? Yes, you Yes, you may, but there will be an objection. I um, do not know where we Chris, let's see here. Adam? Okay, uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my uh, amendment is one which would uh, allow the uh, the new Secretary of Homeland uh, Security to uh, designate, after a uh, terrorist act, would allow for him to designate folks uh, who are trained pharmacists to uh, provide uh, injections and medication uh, in, in the uh, event that uh, he deems it to be an emergency. Uh, what we have, this came to my attention, Mr. Chairman, from uh, some members of our pharmaceutical uh, community in Maryland. Uh, where we have a situation where they can, um, they, they are trained to inject uh, uh, drugs, uh, but, but, in 39, but, but in 39 other states, they can't do it in Maryland, but in 39 other states they can. And so uh, basically the aim of the, of the legislation, I mean of the amendment, would be to allow, uh, to allow for 
uh, for that. And uh, we think that, you know, when you think about Americans uh, wanting to come to the rescue and to support our country, uh, we have a group of pharmacists uh, and people who are trained in that, uh, in, in injecting medication, uh, who would not now be allowed to do that, basically based on state law in 11 of our states. And that would be the uh, gist of the amendment. Thank you very much. Mr. Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the committee for their patience. Uh, in, as part of our work on the Subcommittee on National Security and our substantial number of hearings on terrorism and, and homeland security, we have focused on, among other things, port security. And oddly, this bill in its over 200 pages is, is rather silent on the issue of port security. A great deal of attention is given to the immigration issues. A substantial portion is devoted to our land border issues and our airport security issues. And really, there is uh, very little dedicated to uh, seaport security. My amendment, uh, which passed unanimously in the Government Reform Committee, which is no small feat uh, in a committee led by Mr. Waxman and Mr. Burton, transfers existing authority from DOT to Homeland Security as it relates to seaport security, tracking very closely the fact that under the current proposal, Coast Guard is already moved over under this proposed legislation, and primary jurisdiction over seaport security rests with the Coast Guard. However, the law is crafted to give it to DOT, and this would transfer the authority and the reporting requirements to Homeland Security, which I believe is, is a accurately described as a clarifying amendment. We have seen a number of, of, of instances over the past several years where seaport security has been breached. Uh, a number of reports are, are out there that, that establish very clearly our vulnerabilities. In 1998, a private weapons collector was able to smuggle in two Scud missiles through our seaports. We've had uh, suspected terrorists caught in container cargo vessels with uh, that are outfitted for the, the shipment of, of, um, of terrorists and of people over the high seas. So it's, it's clearly an issue that I think needs to be addressed. And this issue, the, the way that we address it is, is really a fairly uh, simple manner and, and transfers existing authority. You, you've spoken, Ms. Schakowsky. I, I have you addressed your, have I, you addressed your amendment? I had about two or three minutes. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, well, well, if I could uh, just say that whether one agrees or not with the substance of the amendment, the issue of Freedom of Information Act, I think, is worthwhile having a, a discussion on the floor of the House with the, the full body. Um, this bill would say that the current act sufficiently provides for exemptions for information, both for companies that want, don't want to disclose confidential information and certainly for national security, and that to uh, extend those uh, exemptions any further um, would be a um, disservice to the American public and our, freedom, our right to, to know. And this, uh, my amendment um, number 51 also um, deals with the issue of whistleblower protection. Those, I think, are, are worthy of full discussions in this uh, as we move this bill toward its uh, final form. So I would just urge that they be co considered, um, uh, that you would allow them to be amend amendments. Thank you. Mr. Turner, were you up? Did you have the opportunity to testify on your amendment? I did earlier. I was coming back to respond to questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Maloney? I've already tested. Ms. Chase? I'd be happy to respond to questions. I want to make one closing point before we adjourn. Mr. Turner, would you uh, explain your amendment uh, and the action that was taken by your committee? Uh, you heard uh, the majority leader, Mr. Army's characterization of the action taken by the committee that your amendment attempts to restore on the question of indemnification. Would, uh, could you explain what the committee actually did? Uh, I'd be happy to. And, and I think it's important for us to understand why we're even talking about this issue. It's because the contracting community came to Mr. Davis and I as the chairman and ranking member of the procurement subcommittee with what they perceived to be a problem. That is, they're concerned that they may not be able to accept the business risk 
of offering this sophisticated technology to defend against terrorism unless they have some protection. And the language that Mr. Davis and I uh, looked at was brought to us by these federal contractors. And what you have before us in our amendment is the work product of that community. And they didn't ask for what Mr. Army has laid out. They asked for what Mr. Davis and I have laid out. And there's a very distinct difference. And I think it's important to understand that the approach that Mr. Davis and I and the contracting community take is not inconsistent with what is already done at the federal level. So I think it's a mischaracterization to call it a philosophical difference because under current law, we as the federal government indemnify contractors today. Every time a missile is launched by the Department of Defense, by Lockheed Martin, there is an indemnity agreement executed to protect that company from a catastrophic loss in the event that missile were to land in downtown Chicago. And that authority is derived from existing law and executive order. And so all we're doing in our proposal is saying we need to extend that law to the Department of Homeland Security and any other agency that acquires uh, equipment or services dedicated to defending against terrorism so that those companies will be able to accept the business risk of providing that service or that product to the federal government. Now, Mr. Army's approach is to say, first, he would establish what is called in his provision a contractor defense. That contractor defense would arise out of the Secretary of Homeland Defense examining the product and certifying that it's safe, giving it a certificate. And once that product has that certificate, Mr. Army's provision says that there will arise a government contractor defense that will make them immune from any liability unless it is proven that in the course of getting the certificate, the company misrepresented the product to the government. So once they've got the certificate, there is no liability for the provision of a good or service to the federal government. Now, Mr. Army's provision goes on to say that if a contractor provides the same product to a state or to a commercial entity, another business, that the only liability that will exist is the liability that would be the amount of insurance that the contractor provides. Now, that is a dramatic change in the law. And it is telling the American public that in the event a terrorist gets through some of this sophisticated equipment and the terrible destruction that results was a proximate cause of the negligence of the contractor, that you as the American public will have no cause of action. Now, I don't believe we want to tell the American people in advance that there's going to be no coverage in the event that kind of tragedy occurs. So what Mr. Davis and I have done is taken the suggestion of the parties who bring this issue to us, and we've said, let's extend current law and allow the government to negotiate indemnity, which is what happens today. Now, we, in the provision, set up a little formalized, more formalized procedure because currently, as it's practiced, Lockheed Martin is an example, gets indemnity after they get the contract awarded. Then they negotiate <laughs> indemnity. What our language says is that this, the provision of indemnity, the proposal for indemnity, will be known by all bidders before the bids are taken. And our language says the government can indemnify in whole or in part. So if the government wants to say, Lockheed Martin, you're responsible up to the reasonable amount of insurance that you, we know you can get, which is what our bill says. And above that, we will accept a percentage or a part of the liability. And that is an important provision because it goes to the heart of Mr. Army's objection, which he says, I don't want, as he said tonight, the taxpayers to be liable for these catastrophic losses, and I don't want to sign the taxpayer up to cover whatever the bill is. 
So we leave it in the hands of the agency head to negotiate in advance what the proposal for indemnity will be. What portion will the government be willing to take? And the only amount that we should offer is the amount sufficient to be sure that we can acquire the technology. Now, Mr. Hastings and Ms. Myrick signed the letter asking Mr. Army to adopt this language. I know Mr. Frost is supportive of the language. And I think the 40 people, 20 Democrats and 20 Republicans who signed the letter asking for it, believe this is the right way to do it. And I would urge the committee to allow us to have the opportunity to make this argument on the floor and to do it in the way that's already done under existing law and not raise a very contentious issue that has not been asked for by, by the very parties that this whole issue uh, is about. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Uh, uh, if I could, uh, did, did, I, oh, if sorry. I could conclude, I, Mr. Turner, I, uh, I appreciate your explanation. And while I can understand Mr. Army's pride in authorship, uh, I don't think that any one member should be entitled to uh, protect from consideration, from amendment, a particular provision because he's afraid you might win. Uh, I certainly hope that you were given the opportunity to offer your amendment on the floor, particularly since it uh, represents the work of your committee on a bipartisan basis, and I thank you. Thank you. Ms. Myrick. No, I was just going to ask what the vote was in your committee on that particular amendment. It was unanimous. Uh, the only uh, voice of concern was raised by Mr. Waxman, who generally had the philosophy that we shouldn't be absolving anyone of their own negligence. Mm -hmm. And after working with him the last several days, he's come to the conclusion that this is the right thing to do. And as I say, many people didn't really realize that the government already does this. So we right. just did it a few months ago when uh, the government bought Cipro. Mm -hmm. We, we uh, indemnified that manufacturer. Yes. I, I would just like to say as a member of this committee for uh, now 16 years, this was a true example of a bipartisan effort and one in which the entire committee felt was important. And I think it would be uh, very important that uh, the debate be allowed on the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. McGovern. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a, a few questions. First, uh, Ms. Schakowsky, just so I can, under, I'm trying to understand why there would be any controversy over your FOIA amendment. Um, during the uh, committee consideration, did anyone uh, ever provide you or with any example of any companies providing information that was released? Uh, I thank you for that question, Mr. McGovern, because we explicitly asked both in the committee hearing and today, as a matter of fact, when the FBI and the um, Department of Commerce were before my uh, subcommittee, Mr. Horns, and my subcommittee on government efficiency, can you give me any example where a federal agency has di disclosed voluntarily submitted data against the express wish of the industry which submitted the information. And they said no, They're, they could not think of any example. Yeah, I, I guess I, what I'm trying to understand is what, what are the, you know, do these companies not trust uh, the Bush administration, uh, uh, the president, to, to keep this information well, yes, secure? yes, we were is hearing that, that it wasn't conducive, that it didn't create a conducive atmosphere for these um, private uh, corporations to give information to the, the government, and we had to make the atmosphere more conducive, despite the fact that we have these um, exemptions explicitly laid out in the Freedom of Information Act. And in 1987, President Reagan issued Executive Order 12600, which provides another process for business to make its case before the agency and before a court of law to not um, have this information made public. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the dissenting views uh, on, the, on H.R. 5005, and, and one of the things it says, it says that the bill would broaden the uh, FOIA exemption, defining critical infrastructure in such broad terms that it would even cover corporations seeking liability protection. For example, an energy company could hide from the, pu could hide from the public information about a leak at its nuclear power plant simply by submitting information unsolicited uh, to the Department of Homeland Security. I mean, That's seems, the concern. Yeah, yeah. It seems to me that Homeland Security, you know, also needs to protect people from corporate misbehavior. 
um, and, uh, and people have a right to know certain things. And I would hope that, uh, that your amendment would be allowed so that we don't tighten this thing up to the point where people are being denied information that we have fought many, many years to get them access to. Um, one other question to you uh, with regards to the, your, the whistleblower legislation. I mean, I, it just seems to me on that, I mean, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, whistleblowers do have a right to, uh, to seek a remedy, uh, you know, uh, if they're punished for, for speaking up. And they deserve uh, to have a, a set of rights in place so that they can um, be protected. Otherwise, there's not much of an incentive for them to, uh, to speak up. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think your, your, your amendment is, is well worth considering, and I hope we, we make it in order. Thank you. Um, let me, I just want to ask Mr. Shays, just, uh, uh, I, I, Mr. Linder asked uh, uh, the uh, majority leader about your amendment, uh, and, uh, and I think he made some reference about putting it in his pocket and considering it. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, is that a yes or, or a no in terms of whether it would be part of a manager's amendment, uh, or whether or not uh, he gave you any indication whether he'd be at least willing to allow you to have an up or down vote on it. I, I think it wasn't a no. Yeah, so, okay. um, but let me just say, if I, and I do appreciate you for asking the question, the Office of National Drug Control Policy has language that requires the Director of Central Intelligence to cooperate with the Office of, of National Drug Control Policy. Implicit in the Homeland Security Bill is cooperation. There's a big plug-in. It's one of the, the four pillars. But at no language is there a requirement that allows the uh, Director of Homeland Security to be an aggressive consumer. It's more like they're a passive consumer. And the, the Director of Homeland Security needs to be able to task and refocus collection of raw data. It does not give the Director of Homeland Security any um, ability to deal with methods and practices. It just tells them, we want this information. This wasn't good enough. We want it a different way. But it lets the Director decide how that happens. I do appreciate yeah, you know, it. It seems to me it makes a lot of sense. I, I think it's, it's, it's a good amendment. I hope we hope you have a chance to offer it. Let me just, Mr. Putnam, just one question on, on your amendment. Uh, uh, has the uh, Committee of Jurisdiction, I guess, which would be the Transportation Committee, do they have an opinion on on this? Has the Chairman or the Ranking Member uh, weighed in on, on your amendment? Or do you know? Or? I don't know. Okay. All right. I believe uh, I got the Ranking Member here, but I don't know. Uh, but I can't answer that. Okay. Um, and uh, Ms. Maloney, with regard to your amendment, I just wanted to ask uh, a question here, just to clarify. The options that, uh, that this amendment gives to the Secretary are only after he or she uh, has designated the, the, the disaster a homeland security event and only if he or she determines the assistance is, is necessary. Uh, none, of, am I correct, none of this assistance is, is mandatory? That, that's correct. It's, correct. it's all a, an option at, at the discretion of the homeland secretary. And all of these actions that we put in the bill require action by Congress and it grew out of the experiences that we had in New York after 9-11. Uh, we could all have such a disaster in our own districts. And this type of, this amendment would, we would be ready for them we, so that we could react quickly. And if you can react quickly, then it, it really prevents uh, future problems. Uh, and, and so it's very important. And I hope it's uh, would, uh, would this Would this assistance be available following a natural disaster? No, only terrorism and, and, and uh, disasters such as 9-11. Okay. And, and why are hospitals and schools getting aid in your amendment? Uh, doesn't FEMA already, uh, already, uh, already do that? According to FEMA's guidelines, they were not able to reimburse schools for lost instructional time, um, for uh, transportation, for uh, food, for many of the expenses that the, the school system experienced and to this day, 10 months after, they still have not re reimbursed the New York City public school system. Um, uh, Director Alba has told us that he wants to reimburse the school system. The money is sitting there waiting in a pot. It's already been allocated, and, and uh, we thank the Congress for it. But he says his guidelines will not permit him to release it. Uh, this would allow it to be released for lost instructional time, destruction of, 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 of materials and books and uh, mental uh, health uh, cost and others. The same likewise for, for hospitals. Uh, they can uh, reimburse for, say, a, a, an ambulance that's destroyed, but not for, for the cost of, 
responding, the personnel cost of responding. And in New York, they literally emptied the hospitals, uh, took people out of operating rooms to get ready for the disaster, yet this expense was not covered. Again, he says he'd like to reimburse it, but their guidelines don't permit it. This would allow the discretion of the director to respond to, to the emergency. So I, I feel uh, that it's an important amendment. I hope it's put in uh, uh, for consideration, uh, and, I, and again, it was uh, approved in bipartisan uh, support in the committee. I appreciate that. Um, Thank and, you. And just, Mr. Cummings, I, want to, I, I, I strongly support your amendment as well. I mean, I, I think one of the things that uh, we, need, we need to do better is utilize our health care professionals, our hospitals, and our pharmacists, uh, and get them more involved in, in, this, uh, in this potential war on terrorism and dealing with some of the threats. I mean, pharmacists are, are qualified, are tra well, are trained physicians. Um, I should just point out that uh, we have another problem, too, and that is we have a shortage of pharmacists in this country. Oh, yeah. uh, and we need to figure out a way uh, to deal with that as well. Um, but uh, I think your amendment makes a lot of sense, and I, ho I hope we have a chance to, to, to ha have you offer it. Mr. I hope so, too, Mr. Governor. Thank you. If, if I may just uh, sure. more fully answer your question about transportation, the, uh, there are a number of senior transportation members on the Government Reform Committee who had concerns with the order in which we took up our amendment on the basis that they objected to moving Coast Guard at all. Okay. After we disposed of that amendment, it, my amendment, which is embodied here and is a clarifying amendment and I think would be perfect for the manager's amendment, was accepted unanimously on the basis that if you are going to move the Coast Guard, it makes sense to transfer all of the reporting requirements to Congress on the vulnerabilities at our seaports once you've made that decision. So I think once you commit to move the Coast Guard, the reporting issues logically would follow with that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Sessions? No questions, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Very Thank, much. You. Me, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry. Um, uh, is Mr. Shays considered a part of this? Yes. I just would like to respond to I'm sorry. I did not know that. I, I did see him come up, but I did not. Uh, I do have one question. Sure. I'm sorry. You're welcome to Thank uh, the Mr. rest of you. Mr. Mr. Shays, you're the. Uh, author of uh, amendment number 33 right. and really i just like for you to expand on and and provide some information about you know why you believe we need this strategy uh, of an annual threat assessment on a yearly basis i thank the gentleman for asking mr chairman our committee had 19 hearings before 9 11. all three commissions appeared before us the hart rudman the uh, Bremer commission uh, and um, the Gilmore Commission, all three said, you need to know what the, the threat, you need to have understanding of the threat, you need to have a strategy, and then you need to reorganize to deal with it. This bill boggles my mind that they have taken out any real uh, 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 recognition of, of, of what the threat is, what the strategy is, and then how do you reorganize. And we are reorganizing without requiring an annual assessment of the threat, without uh, then adjusting the strategy to meet the threat and then to see how is your uh, structure of reorganization working. And I just really plead with this committee to allow a debate on uh, amendment number 33. Uh, I'm not suggesting it should be part of the manager's amendment. And by the way, I would say to my Democratic colleagues, this is an amendment of Representative Ike Skelton of the Armed Services Committee. That was on his legislation before 9-11. You need to know what the threat is. You need to have a strategy to deal with it, and then you reorganize. I thank the gentleman for asking. I think I'm very satisfied with the response. Thank, thank you, Chris. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, now, um, Ms. Morello, a member of the Government Reform Committee, you're next, and then Ms. Watson, and then Ms. Roberstar. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Boy, any time you need any commendation for your lengthy hours, please call on me. <laughs> people are leaving. This is, this is fun. <laughs> I know it is. I know it's very important. It truly is, and I learned a great deal this evening, too. I'm very pleased <coughs> to appear before you to uh, ask for your permission to offer an amendment to the Homeland Security Bill. And actually what the amendment is trying to do is exactly the same thing as the language in Congressman Thornberry's original Homeland Security Bill and the language that was agreed on um, in, an, in a bipartisan way in the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee today. I only want to protect the union rights of existing employees transferred to the new agency who will have the very same duties. 
Presently, two sections of Title V provide for administrative actions to disallow union membership for certain classes of federal employees. Section 7103 allows the President to issue an executive order taking away Title V labor management rights, including the right to be in a union for agencies or subdivisions for national security reasons. Section 7112 of Title V makes a bargaining unit inappropriate for numerous reasons, including the performance of national security duties. The practical use of this section is an agency or subdivision goes to the Federal Labor Relations Authority, citing positions that should not be in a bargaining unit. And if they're successful, those positions are removed from the bargaining unit. Now, basically, because the new Homeland Security Agency's mission could easily be defined as national security, I'm concerned that potentially tens of thousands of employees could be prevented from being members of a union even though their work has not changed. It's just the department they work for has changed. And, and I think that those employees being transferred to a new agency and doing the very same thing should have the same rights as they did previously. Actually, what the amendment does simply is to grandfather those people who are in certain agencies when they move into the new big homeland security agencies to have the same collective bargaining union rights that they have. Now, why did I, why did I even bring this up? I brought it up really because during this time when we're taking 22 agencies and putting them all within one big agency of homeland security, the, uh, the concern is, will their bargaining rights be taken away? Will there be... Uh, transfers of, of, of authority, and why would we think there might be? Well, there was an example that was given, and that was the example in January when the President uh, decided that 500 employees of the Department of Justice would no longer have their union rights. Now, these employees actually were clerical positions, by and large, and they had been members of the union for like 20 years. On, on top of that, when you have a situation where you, you know, got quotas for reducing the number of people or contracting out in each department, during a time when we talk about reducing the workforce, and particularly a time when we are, we have the the possibility of within the next five years losing like 53 percent of our federal workforce that are ready to retire can, and 70, 71 percent of the senior executive service that will be eligible to retire in five years. I think it's very important we look to the workforce. And I think it's important that we make sure that there are certain uh, securities that they do have. Basically, that's, uh, that's what this uh, little amendment will do. Um, and uh, I do want to point out that current law that would apply explicitly prohibits federal employees from participating in strikes against the against the government, and I think, um, I think this amendment is a very good amendment, a very simple amendment, and again, I want to reiterate that it goes along with language that, um, that Congressman Thornberry's bill, uh, 4660, and Senator Lieberman's bill, Senate Bill 2452, both of those bills specifically state that employees retain their collective bargaining rights unless a majority of employees within the department or applicable subdivision have as their primary job duty intelligence, counterintelligence, or investigative work directly related to terrorism investigation. So uh, we're, we are giving that uh, proviso. So if their job responsibilities change, if they're in a situation where counterintelligence, investigative work intelligence is involved, then they can change. Thank you very much. Mr. Frost? Uh, Ms. Morello, since the majority leader has already uh, endorsed your right to offer your amendment on the floor, I suggest that uh, this may be a time to quit while you're ahead. I'm ready. Mr. McGovern? Well, I, I su support the gentlewoman's amendment, and um, I would just say, would, would you... Would, yes for an answer. Yeah, wait, well, would, you, would you recommend that the Rules Committee make an order or an amendment to add all of the civil service protections adopted by the Government Reform Committee? 
I, I think that there was someone else who may well do it, but I do know that the Government Reform Committee uh, passed <coughs> its, its portion of Homeland Security by a vote of 30 to 2. I just close by expressing my appreciation for, for, for your amendment, uh, and I'll say it, I've been saying it over and over and over again, but I think one of the things we have to make sure of in this Homeland Security bill is that we have strong worker protections uh, built into this, uh, into this bill that uh, we respect people, the unions and people's right to collective bargaining, um, and that we, you know, cause we want to attract the best and the brightest uh, to be part of this. So we don't want to discourage people from working in, uh, in government service. So I, I appreciate your amendment, and um, I, I, I anticipate we've made an order. Thank you, Mr. Thank you McGovern. very much, Mr. Morrell. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Watson, member of the committee. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and members. The Homeland Security Act already addresses many issues intended to protect our nation's infrastructure. The amendment Mr. Horn and I offer would add language to this bill that seeks to protect our nation's family, a fund to support children who lose parents or guardians in a terrorist attack. In the wake of the tragedies of September 11th, many families were left with little time to grieve. Instead, they were almost immediately overwhelmed with the questions of how to manage their affairs without the income provided by their lost loved ones. Congress acted quickly to create a compensation fund. But even then, confusion over how the plan would be administered and implemented caused more worries for victims' families. And the survivors of victims of September 11th, at the least, had access to a support fund. Families of victims of previous terrorist attacks, such as those in Oklahoma City, or Nairobi, or Dar es Salaam, had no such fund. Uh, Mr. Chairman, our amendment seeks to fix this. The amendment would create a fund administered by the Secretary of Homeland Security to be available to provide support for minor children who lose a parent or a guardian in terrorist attacks. This fund will mean that next time we will not be forced to create an ad hoc structure on short notice to assist families. Instead, one will be ready when families are in their hours of greatest need. The amendment does not seek to create a huge new bureaucracy it merely creates a framework to work out policies and procedures in advance of when they might be needed. It is modeled on legislation that created the 9-11 Victims Fund and seeks to build upon the 9-11 Fund's success while incorporating lessons learned from the operation of that fund. This amendment will not solve all the challenges of family who suffer the loss of a parent through a terrorist attack. But I hope that it will mean that we are more prepared to deal with part of the damage that has often been neglected in various terrorist attacks, and that's the damage to our family and our children. Thank you very much. Ms. Myrick? No Ms. Frost? Yeah, no questions. Mr. McGovern? Thank you very much for your time. Yes, and uh, I also was here to support an amendment uh, by Congressman Shays, and uh, that was the amendment to create a mechanism for the Secretary of Homeland Security to report to Congress on the status of America's uh, preparedness. Do you, you have a prepared statement? It will be part of the record. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll hand it out. Uh, Mr. Chairman. If at this point, if I could submit for the record the statement of uh, uh, Congressman Wu, who was here earlier. Without objection. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you, you, members. Part of the record should be happy to take it. <coughs> Mr. Overstar, the Department of Transportation and or the uh, Committee on Transportation Infrastructure has finally come to the pass, and you've been very patient. Welcome. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's been a very instructive process sitting here uh, Not for to the mention last late. hour and 40 plus minutes. I uh, have a very special empathy for those who served on the select committee to create the Department of Homeland Security because 36 years ago, as a as administrative assistant, my predecessor, uh, John Blotnick, uh, I uh, participated in, in the 10-month uh, process of crafting the legislation to create the Department of Transportation. At that time, he was my congressman. <laughs> Is that right? You lived in our district? <laughs> he's, he's from Minnesota. Where, where did you live? Deer River. Deer River. It's still there. Yes, it is. <laughs> All 800 of them. Well, it's about 800 the, strong souls. About, about 900 now, and just got a new housing project right. dedicated there just two weeks ago. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we uh, we labored uh, mightily over 10 months, and and uh, uh, President Johnson signed the bill into law on October 15, and uh, there were only three staff members on the House side, and few more over in the Senate side, and the task was, it seems to me, of, of uh, uh, equal magnitude to the one of creating the uh, Department of uh, Homeland Security. Um, <clears throat> and a year later, we came back to revisit the Department of Transportation after all of our careful deliberation found that we had made a miscalculation. We created an what we thought was an independent safety board within the department to review the safety of all the modes of transportation found that that wasn't going to work and amended the act and established the National Transportation Safety Board as an independent entity outside the Department of Transportation, finding that that was far more effective, a, a watchdog, than one within the department. And it's with that background that I... I uh, urge caution and, and, uh, and careful thought in, in crafting this uh, Department of Homeland Security. And I, I'm here to, to advocate for, for two amendments. One, uh, to strike the language uh, that uh, extends the deadline for compliance uh, uh, the, uh, with installation of explosive detection systems at the nation's airports, a matter to which the majority leader has I think already this would be addressed. a good time to take yes for an answer. Yes, and, and so I, uh, as I say, that, that's already been addressed, and uh, uh, the effect of the amendment will be to restore current law. The, the second uh, is uh, one that I would offer with uh, Mr. Costello, uh, the ranking member of the uh, uh, Subcommittee on Public Buildings and Grounds, Economic Management, Economic Development, and uh, Emergency Management, and Mr. Romer of Indiana, to uh, retain FEMA in its current independent agency status, which is the position of the Committee on Transportation uh, in reporting our work on the transportation on the Homeland Security uh, Department uh, by unanimous bipartisan. Bi that's a redundancy. By unanimous vote of the committee, uh, we uh, voted to retain FEMA in an independent status uh, as it exists today because of its unique role, but with a liaison to the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, the select committee would change that uh, to assume within Homeland Security the role of FEMA. And I would simply like to retain FEMA in its current condition as the committee unanimously reported. I've been thinking about this today. And I, I am inclined to agree with you because I don't think FEMA has a defense role. It has a recovery role, a disaster role. And I don't see where it fits into any defense. Can you? There are four, four roles. Is, members of the committee will recall, FEMA started out as our civil defense agency and evolved from civil defense in the decline of the Cold War into the nation's premier response entity to disaster uh, of, of natural form, whether hurricane, flood, earthquake, blizzard, with now four clearly defined functions, mitigation, that is anticipatory action to prepare communities against repeated disasters, 
preparedness, planning, which was a very unique uh, function of civil defense and, and, uh, and the uh, Emergency Management Administration. The third is response, a very quick response entity that's on the scene, helping communities and individuals respond to tragedies. And the fourth is the recovery after response, rebuilding, uh, return to normal, protect against the future. We think that's very distinct from uh, a, a military role uh, or quasi-military role envisioned for the Department of Homeland Security. I, I agree with you. Thank you. Ms. Myrick, do you have any questions? Mr. Frost? Uh, no questions, just to observe that uh, certainly Mr. Oberstar, as the ranking member, uh, should be entitled to offer the amendment that he is advocating on the floor. Um, and Mr. Army indicated, I think you were in the room, that he feared that you would be successful. Mr. McGovern. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I, as a former member of the Transportation Committee, uh, let me state for the record that if it was up to me, you would have been the first one to testify um, here tonight <laughs> um, because I appreciate the uh, the work of, of, of the committee and your leadership on that committee. I am pleased that uh, the majority leader has has conceded and, uh, and uh, allowed uh, for your amendment to be made in order with regard to the uh, uh, the December 31st deadline extension to equip airports with explosive uh, detection systems. Uh, I think that's I, and it's an important issue. I think it's an issue that people understand. Um, and uh, for the life of me, I can't understand why, you know, the United States of America, the most technologically advanced country in the world, can't meet deadlines uh, to make our airports safe. And uh, someone needs to be in charge to demand uh, that we meet those deadlines. I mean, this is a serious situation. And to, to come this far since September 11th and be told that, you know, uh, have people advocate uh, a deadline of a year. I don't know why with the magic uh, why, why a year versus three months or two months or one month or whatever, but, but a year I think is, uh, you know, I think is, uh, should be a great concern. But let, I just want to ask you one question here. On that. Can you compare this extension of the uh, December 31st deadline uh, to equip uh, airports with this explosive detection uh, uh, systems to the situation we face in regard to the uh, collision avoidance equipment systems? Um, I think that would be a helpful thing to have on the record. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate your very kind uh, comments about my uh, work on the committee. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, in crafting the, the Transportation Security Administration and setting the deadline of December 31st, 2002, uh, we did so knowing the difficulties, knowing the complexities, but fully confident that they could be overcome and that this equipment could be installed in the nation's airports within that timeline and also recognizing that a deadline is necessary for people to complete their uh, tasks. <laughs> Secondly, in, there, there is, there is uh, an associated argument with the extension uh, proposed, and that is that better technology is just around the corner. That better technology consists of the Dreyfus Company's proposal for an explosive detection system that uh, theoretically would process 1,500 bags an hour with low false positives and, and uh, high, high degree of accuracy. This equipment is not yet operational. It has not been tested and certified by the uh, FAA. It has, it, uh, uh, a similar piece of equipment has been tested by the uh, French uh, DGAC, the French Civil Aviation Authority, and rejected in favor of other technology. Uh, there is no assurance that this equipment, even if certified, could be produced in sufficient numbers to be deployed at the nation's airports within another year's time. And in any event, I would compare to, as, as you suggested, in 1985, when I chaired the Investigations and Oversight Subcommittee, near mid-air events, aircraft coming too close to each other, that is within 500 feet of each other, were doubling. I proposed to the FAA, as a result of hearings that uh, Mr. Gingrich 
as ranking member of our committee and I conducted, that the FAA order airlines to install traffic collision avoidance systems, TCAS, aboard aircraft. The airlines objected and the FAA objected and resisted. They said the next generation technology is just around the corner. TCAS 2 only tells an aircraft whether to move up or down to avoid another aircraft intruding in its airspace. We want the next generation that will also tell the aircraft to move horizontally to the right or to the left. I said, while we are waiting, this is in our committee proceedings, while we are waiting for the perfect, the good rests, and the perfect is the enemy of the good. A few weeks later, two airplanes collided over Cerritos, California. Mr. Packard, Republican member of our committee, uh, introduced legislation with my encouragement to require the FAA to require airlines to install traffic collision avoidance systems of the current available technology. People died while we were waiting for the FAA to issue the order. We should not let that happen again. Well, I, I appreciate the gentleman's comments, and I would just say that people can continue to argue that there's better technology around the corner, but uh, uh, I think we need to learn from the lessons of the past, um, and we need to act uh, as quickly as, as humanly possible, and I think we need to stick to these deadlines. And one final question, um, aren't there provisions in current law for TSA to work with the airports if they, if they cannot meet the, uh, the, uh, the December 31st deadline? The uh, uh, Transportation uh, Security Act provides that in the event the TSA cannot install explosive detection systems at airports by the December 31, 2002 deadline, alternative means of comparable quality will be available to the TSA to screen checked luggage, such as uh, hand search, positive pa passenger bag match, for both uh, uh, originating and connecting flights, and uh, uh, and uh, hand search of uh, luggage, and any other method that TSA may recommend as the equivalent. Yeah, well, then it seems to me that there's no reason for this exemption to be in the in the uh, in the in the special committee's bill. So I, I look forward to supporting the gentleman's amendment and look forward to a big victory. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? No. Nope. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McGovern. Let me just say uh, thank you uh, for your testimony. I've been in and out of the room, but I've been told by a number of my colleagues that <clears throat> it's been uh, helpful. And of course, when you brought back to, uh, to mind uh, Ron Packard's effort in dealing with the TCAS following that horrible, horrible crash that I uh, remember well over Cerritos, which is not too far from the area I represent, I obviously am very, very sensitive to that. So thank you for being here and thanks for, uh, for your uh, fine work and I will assure you that we're going to give very serious consideration to uh, your amendment, especially in light of the... Mr. Chairman, may I just discussion. make one other observation, that is I, we have not been able to review the proposed manager's amendment mm -hmm. in detail, but the lang but some language that uh, has come to my attention would provide uh, relief of liability for security companies, those that were providers let of security. Let me just say that the managers. The I, I, let me just say that the uh, manager's amendment um, has um, been submitted, and it's possible that there, before we finish our final work product, might be some modifications. And I, I'm very clear as to where you stand on that uh, issue. I think. But thank you. It would be a travesty to relieve right. Argenbright of right. its responsibility. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. Our next witness is the uh, distinguished chairman of the Committee on Veterans Affairs, my uh, friend and classmate, member of the Committee on International Relations, Mr. Smith. So, Mr. Smith, please uh, come forward. It's uh, a little after midnight. We're happy to have you with us. And um, I appreciate the forbearance of all of our colleagues who are going with us, especially our colleagues on the Rules Committee who have uh, been going through a very challenging time. And let me say that if you have prepared remarks, uh, they will without objection appear in their entirety in the record, and uh, we would welcome a summary as we uh, try to charge towards completion here. 
You might push that little push that little button right we'll there. Submit that for the record. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. You. Chairman. Chairman, I uh, join with uh, Tim Romer, who is on the floor uh, at this moment working on the uh, intelligence bill, uh, in asking that the committee approve a blue ribbon commission. You're very familiar, I think, with its contents. Uh, but just to say, the genesis of this blue ribbon commission was with the widows, the family members who came to me and to many others very early on. Uh, asking that such a commission be so configured. Uh, I, I have perhaps a somewhat unique position or, or, or I insight into the need, uh, not just for accountability, but for a lessons learned. Uh, I chaired the International Ops Committee for six years, and, and I'll never forget when the bombings occurred in our embassies uh, in Africa, I convened a series of hearings, and we, just, we, we looked into what was done particularly post Bobby Inman and his recommendations that he had made years before, and the fact that there was very little follow through. Admiral Crow came and testified and uh, was aghast that so many of the recommendations and so many within our own State Department uh, were so nonchalant when it came to uh, security. Even though we were getting threats every day, uh, terrorism had become transnational at that point, moving from country to country. Uh, I was actually the author of the, uh, of the Embassy Security Act, which took on a lot of names that ended up being the Admiral Nance Meg Donovan Foreign Relations Act, $6 billion for embassy security. It still wasn't enough. Obviously, 9-11 happened, and we never got these people. But I do believe the time has really come for a, a, a Blue Ribbon Commission to look into every aspect. The scope would be very wide. It would look at uh, not just intelligence, because I believe the Shambliss report and what Porter Goss and, and our, our other colleagues are doing probably and most likely will suffice on the intelligence side. But when you get to diplomacy, State Department, INS, and a host of other uh, agencies, we're not going to get that look uh, with recommendations as well as an accountability as to what happened. We may, but I don't think it's likely to happen. And uh, I, I think you know, a true lessons learned going forward. What what needs to be enacted into law? We took Thanks, Mr. Dryer. Appreciate Thank you. that. And um, I have no questions. You made it very clear. Mr. Linder. Mr. McGovern. Yes, Mr. Price, I think it's a good idea, and I hope that uh, you get a chance to offer it. Thank you very much. Ms. Price? No questions. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Hastings? Mrs. Myrick? No Mr. Reynolds? Thank you very much for being here, Chris. We sure appreciate it. Um, as we uh, continue down the list, uh, Mr. Crowley is from the Committee on International Relations. We'll do that, and then we'll go to Mr. Smith and uh, Ms. Jackson Lee and then Lynn Woolsey, and let me say again that any prepared remarks that you have will appear in the record and if you have a summary we would appreciate that thank you mr chairman thank Welcome. you for this opportunity to have you thanks for being so patient Appreciate you back again uh, this year um i just have two amendments uh, that i'd mm -hmm. like to offer and i uh, hope that they would be uh, allowed to be offered um, to hr 5005 the homeland security act 2002 uh, the first, Mark Crowley 71, would authorize the secretary to establish a scholarship program for American minority students or U.S. <clears throat> citizens to encourage them to further their understanding of foreign cultures and language, other ethnic backgrounds, and apply them to a career in national security agencies, including but not limited to intelligence agencies, Department of State, Defense, Homeland Security, and United States government. Uh, this amendment is not intended to deal with uh, the issue of affirmative action but rather a reflection on the needs of our intelligence agency to infiltrate our enemies' organizations with people who look like them, who speak like them, and who inherently understand their cultures and mores. If our intelligence agencies want to infiltrate the Al-Qaeda and, and monitor ter terrorist groups like them, as well as other groups that foment strife around the world, uh, they, need to staff, they need staff who can blend into, the, into societies around this world. As we all know, the future national security and economic well-being of the United States will depend on the ability of our citizens to understand, influence, and respond to ethno-national conflicts and the social and political factors that cause others to support international terrorist groups. Our national security agencies need to rethink the ways in which they approach problems of terrorism. And many uh, Americans of minority descent already speak the languages of their homeland and understand the traditions and culture. They therefore have the potential to offer the federal government their insights into political, economic, and social developments abroad. 
uh, recipients uh, would be required to work for the federal government in the subject area that they were studied. Recipients would also be able to meet their service requirements by teaching the issues they have studied to other Americans as well, an option that helps ensure that a wider segment of the U.S. population uh, receives this expertise in language and uh, uh, foreign languages and cultures. Uh, we need to consider education, I believe, as a critical element of our homeland security. We can spend billions of dollars on the short-term fixes, but the long-term fixes I think we have to put more emphasis on. My amendment is modeled on the National Security Education Program, but with a more specific focus on the special skills that minority American students can bring to the effort to further U.S. national security. Uh, the N NSEP has no such focus. My amendment will permit us to take advantage of our ethnic diversity. Our minority students already possess a rich understanding of languages and cultures. We need to encourage them to hone these skills and pursue careers in government. Uh, my second amendment, Crowley 69, deals with the serious concerns about our nation's public health infrastructure and, uh, and in particular, the production and distribution of needed medical vaccines. We all recognize that the defense of the homeland involves troops, weaponry, and technology, but it also involves a strong pu public health infrastructure to deal with any biological attacks that could be planned on our citizens. Uh, for many of the substances our country is likely to be, to be threatened with, such as anthrax or smallpox, there are vaccines that can, that can prevent uh, that spread. But while these vaccines exist, we have no central authority in our homeland command structure to oversee supply and manage distribution in case of national emergency. Studies done by the, done by the Centers of Disease Control show that a number of common vaccines are in short supply and have been in short supply around our country. In fact, the CDC recently predicted a shortage of vaccines of eight of the 11 vaccine preventable diseases in the United States, including smallpox and polio the worst rates of shortages in the last 29 years. Over the past several years, our country has been unable to get enough flu vaccines to the communities that need them around our country. People who need the flu vaccine are forced to go without. Uh, this would tell us that there's something very, very wrong with the distribution of vaccines. In fact, many uh, young children were not able to receive their vaccinations on time. The poorest of Americans were not able to receive their vaccinations on time this year. What happens if our country's enemies choose to attack us with smallpox? Without access to vaccines, we risk countless and needless American deaths. These deaths for which the medical scientists have, have provided a cure. But a cure is useless unless there is someone to oversee the cure's implementation and distribution. Therefore, my amendment would create a vaccine office at the Department of Homeland Security to serve as a central clearinghouse for the purchase, distribution, and national monitoring of vaccines. The goal of this bill is to put all the major functions and agencies that directly support homeland defense under one agency. Our nation's health security and vaccines needed to ensure our health security are an integral part of this nation's uh, uh, strategy for a homeland security. Therefore, I'm hopeful that the committee will rule both of my amendments in order. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Crowley. Mr. Blender? Mr. Frost? No questions. Ms. Price? Thank you, sir. Mr. McGovern? Thank you all Mr. Very Hastings? Much. Mrs. Myrick? Mr. Reynolds? Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. Let me say that uh, what we're planning to uh, do now is proceed with our friend from Texas, Mr. Smith, and then we will um, uh, welcome Sheila Jackson Lee, who's also on the Committee on the Judiciary. Then my California colleague, Glenn Woolsey, whom I see is, is here. Uh, and then um, Juanita Melinda McDonald from the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. And then Mr. Cardin from the Committee on Ways and Means. And I notice Mr. Womp is here. And uh, he will be our last witness since Mr. Hastings, who is scheduled, I guess, uh, is uh, not going to be here. If he's back, then we will certainly welcome him. So that should, uh, we hope, complete the uh, testimony for this very important piece of legislation. Mr. Smith, welcome. Thank you very much. Let me say, as I've said to the other witnesses, that your prepared remarks will, without objection, appear in the record in their entirety, and we would welcome a summary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what I'd like to do is to ask you and other members of the Rules Committee to make and order a bill that passed the full House last week with only three votes against it. Uh, this is a bill that involves efforts to try to prevent, detect, deter, and better respond to a cybercrime type attack. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you know and as all my colleagues know from the briefings we've received and from articles we've read in newspapers, uh, that we expect that it, there is at least a 50-50 possibility that the next terrorist attack against the 
the United States, if there is one, uh, will involve some form of cyber crime, either in conjunction with a low-tech, perhaps uh, explosive device, or cyber crime wholly by itself. Uh, we have approved on the uh, Judiciary Committee and in the House three cybercrime bills this year, Mr. Chairman. The first one was incorporated and became a part of the Patriot Act. The second is successfully uh, navigating its way through the Senate. And this is the third, which, as I say, passed the House last week with only minimum opposition. So I hope you will make it in order. I'd like to summarize the legislation uh, very quickly by saying that it increases penalties to better reflect the seriousness of cybercrime. It enhances federal, state, and local law enforcement efforts through better coordination. It assists state and local law enforcement officials through better grant management, accountability, and dissemination of technical advice and information. I also want to quote from a uh, newspaper article, uh, Mr. Chairman, that shows uh, how important is, it is that this legislation be enacted into law as quickly as possible. According to this newspaper article, quote, unsettling signs of al-Qaeda's aims and skills in cyberspace have led some government experts to conclude that terrorists are at the threshold of using the Internet as a direct instrument of bloodshed. Most significantly, perhaps, U.S. investigators have found evidence in the logs that mark a browser's path through the Internet that al-Qaeda operators spent time on sites that offer software and, program and programming instructions for the digital switches that run power, water, transport, and communication grids. Mr. Chairman, the description of those uh, energy and communication grids happen to be in California. And uh, that is yet another reason why I hope you will uh, make this uh, legislation in order and why we can do a better job uh, by uh, protecting the American people if we do so. I'll well, be thank you very much. And, uh, I appreciate uh, your interest and attention to uh, the unique needs of the state of California and, uh, and to uh, Texas and the entire country as well. And you've Thank you, Mr. made the case very strongly, and I appreciate your hard work here. Mr. Linder, Mr. Frost, no Mr. Hastings, Mr. McGovern, Mrs. Myrick, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much for being here, Lamar. We appreciate it. Our next witness is the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. We're happy to have you. And let me say uh, <clears throat> again, as I said to our colleagues, that uh, without objection, any prepared remarks that you have will appear in their entirety in the record. And uh, we would welcome your summary if uh, that's uh, possible. Members of the Judiciary Committee, no, Rules Committee, thank you very much. Uh, and um, I would like to use for the First Amendment that I have um, a pictorial viewpoint, which will help me uh, discuss this rather quickly. First, let me say to the Rules Committee, thank you very much for your time here and for the opportunity to discuss amendments that I hope will be made in order and as well to uh, give the opportunity for discussion of these amendments. Uh, I'd like to first start, uh, Mr. Chairman, to say that I have, uh, throughout my tenure on the Judiciary Committee, uh, indicated that immigration does not equate to terrorism, and so I believe Though we are talking about the Homeland Security Department, I think that we have a great opportunity to balance uh, the needs uh, that we have uh, with some of the civilian services that are in the Homeland Security Department and be effective in protecting this nation. The First Amendment uh, deals with Division uh, 5 or creating a Division 5. Uh, you can see the initial organization of the Homeland Security Department had border and transportation security as one, including immigration issues as one. Uh, and I thought, uh, as I looked at the immigration process, uh, serving on the immigration subcommittee, uh, that a Division Five would be very effective. It is in the purple. It unites uh, enforcement and immigration services, uh, but it takes into consideration the distinct responsibilities of those two areas. It is somewhat like the legislation that we passed here in the House, H.R. 3231, 405, 409, 100, 409 votes, that has uh, immigration services, but it also has immigration security. And one of the reasons why we passed that legislation is we thought there needed to be consistency in how we enforce the laws as well as how we have people access citizenship. This uh, amendment takes into consideration the Hyde Amendment and visa processing. It also takes into consideration how we treat children. It's over at uh, the HHS. Uh, and I'd ask uh, uh, the members of the Rules Committee to consider this amendment. Uh, in fact, 
Uh, it also has an ombudsman because there are concerns by immigration groups that you'd be putting the individuals who are just accessing services over in enforcement. And what we do is we think we can balance it by having a fifth division. So I'd appreciate the consideration of the committee on that amendment. I believe the amendment dealing with uh, council is self-explanatory, and I'll ask uh, the members of the Rules Committee to look at that. It merely says to allow council to uh, be uh, available for minors who come under the Homeland Security Department within a 24-hour period and to have them have the ability to access their parent if they come under the Homeland Security Department. Uh, I believe, um, having said on the Science Committee and said on the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee, that NASA is a very important asset for this nation. Uh, I noted that the increase in interest in NASA came about in the last couple of years when it was noted that the research uh, on the space station involved diabetes and stroke and heart disease. The American people were able to relate to it. I believe we miss a very large opportunity uh, to utilize the assistance of NASA in not having them collaborate with the Homeland Security Department. This amendment uh, would create uh, an office within NASA to coordinate some of the unique technologies that I believe would be very, very effective uh, in helping us fight terrorism. And I think NASA would be a very fine partner in this as they have accessed uh, exciting new technology that would be available uh, for utilizing in, uh, in the fight of terrorism. And I would hope that we'd be able to establish this internal office, which I think would be extremely effective. Uh, the amendment uh, that I have regarding uh, a assistant to the secretary to deal with providing access for women in small businesses is of great concern to many of our constituents. Homeland Security is important, but it also will be a large contractor. And there are a lot of technologies and a lot of businesses that are housed in small and women-owned businesses. This amendment would provide for a special assistant to the Secretary of Homeland Security to promote the use of women and small business concerns owned and controlled by socially uh, econo and economically disadvantaged individuals. The present legislation does not address the issue of small businesses, and I would hope my colleagues would uh, support that. My amendment number 50 uh, deals with the question of protecting uh, the uh, contractors or the business that is done by Homeland Security uh, from the issues of kickback, uh, providing whistle protection, whistleblower protection, protection of minorities and small businesses, prohibitions of contracting with individuals who have been convicted of contract-related felonies, and a prohibition of federal funds. The present legislation does not provide that. And I think it's extremely important, though we have Homeland Security, and it's a key uh, focus for us, that we not eliminate the protection, uh, providing, uh, ensuring that we don't have businesses that are doing business uh, that have been convicted of felonies in doing improper contract work, and as well, uh, that we pro provide whistleblower protection. And particularly, if an employee of a contract company wants to indicate that something is awry, they should be able to say it and be protected. The last amendment, I believe, is consistent with the Pelosi Amendment and the Frost Amendment, providing protection to civil service employees, and it speaks for itself. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. I hope uh, that uh, the Rules Committee will consider the Fifth Division, and particularly the utilization of NASA, I think, is extremely important. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Hastings, Mr. McGovern. Yeah, I, I don't have any questions. I just want to thank the gentlewoman for, for her testimony. I want to thank her for uh, her work in trying to make sure that um, INS uh, has a sense of justice and cares about children. Uh, and I appreciate her work in, in that regard. I also appreciate her advocacy for civil service protections of, for Homeland Security uh, employees because I think it's important that we have a, a workforce that, uh, that, that, uh, in which their rights are protected. So I, I, I thank you for your testimony. If I might, Mr. McGovern, just simply say that um, I think it's important to restate my reasons for the Fifth Division, uh, allowing the fact that there was a different approach from judiciary uh, which I respect. But I believe that we lose something if we do not keep services and enforcement together and we don't have single interpretations by the general counsel as to the work that is done in that uh, department. And I think we can balance enforcement with services, right. keeping it under Homeland Security. I appreciate your comments. Thank you.
Um, Mr. And Mrs. Myrick, <clears throat> Mr. Frost. And I uh, thank the gentlewoman for your patience, for staying up, up with us late, and for your uh, good testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Reynolds. I associate myself with the remarks of Mr. Frost. I thank you for your patience. I thank you for staying up with us, and thanks for bringing your charts in to show us after midnight. And uh, you've made a very compelling case. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And our next witness is uh, my California colleague, Ms. Woolsey. Thank you very much for joining us. Are you as awake as the rest of us are? I've been here a long time, Mr. Chairman. Yes, and we hope, you, hope you, you almost felt like you remember the Rules Committee. Well, except uh, this has given me a great overview of what you do, and I can't imagine doing this every night. So, <laughs> we do it every you. night. We, we, we do it seven nights a week, and uh, we it. never miss Not it. Not seven let me just say, Let me just say that uh, your prepared statement will uh, appear in its entirety it. in, the, in the record. And, uh, and I'm would, making uh, it shorter. Thank you. But I want to take just this opportunity to tell Mr. Hastings uh, thank you for a very good job that you did with the uh, Trafficant uh, discussion tonight. That was hard, the whole thing. All right, thank you for having me. And my amendment, I have two amendments, but they do exactly the same thing. Uh, the reason they're different is you can choose where to put them in the bill. Uh, my amendment creates a Homeland Security Institute, uh, and it clearly ha it has clearly defined responsibilities. And during our Science Committee's markup of HR 5005, the creation of an institute was voice voted uh, with absolutely no opposition. Uh, but the bill before us today uh, does not require its creation nor explicitly define uh, what the duties would be. So it doesn't cover those duties in any way. The concept of a Homeland Security Institute is based on the key recommendation from the National Academy of Sciences report, making the nation safer, the role of science and technology in countering terrorism. The institute would be a nonprofit, federally funded institute or think tank like organization. As an outside objective entity, the Institute will analyze the vulnerabilities in our critical infrastructures and evaluate the effectiveness of systems we deploy to reduce those vulner vulnerabilities. Other government agencies, including DOD, DOE, HHS, and uh, NSF, currently sponsor more than 35 institutes uh, like I'm, I'm recommending here. Uh, we would make certain that our newest government, I and mean, we should make certain that our newest uh, government department also utilizes these tools. Fact of the matter is uh, existing federal agencies just can't supply the department with the depth and breadth of technical expertise needed in this area. And uh, we want qualified individuals, as uh, somebody has said earlier, uh, making these uh, professionally important decisions. And they, there are many outside our government. Now, the committee will note that I've offered two amendments to accomplish exactly the same goal, so that you have a choice legislatively on how to create the Institute. So I leave that with you. Uh, I thank you for being here and being <coughs> awake and listening to all of us. Thank you very and, much, um, Ms. Woolsey. We appreciate I your think it'd be a good uh, sticking thing to it out with this. us, and thanks for uh, making a very compelling case. Mr. Yeah. Hastings. Uh, one quick question. How does what you're proposing differentiate what, there, what is being discussed in this bill with the national labs? Or are, are they Well, it's like or? the national. I mean, it's, it's contracted out, but this would be uh, a different entity. It would be to uh, advise on the vulnerabilities. It wouldn't be, it would not be setting up a particular project. It would be looking at projects from the outside okay. and advising on those. And uh, letting us know when that project may not be safe because indeed it was uh, a new system or a new program or something that we needed to uh, be more careful with. I was just curious because you said the, the Committee on Science uh, had, uh, I thought I heard you say, had, yeah. had your language in it. And they do. This, this didn't, but it, there was an emphasis on national labs and I just wondered if there was some inconsistencies in that that's all. no it's modeled after the national labs actually okay. only the what they do would be slightly different good thank you thank you mr frost no question. mrs myrick no mr mcgovern just, just one question who, who would who would staff this homeland security institute i mean what's the best 
the scientists we have or the who would, who would be who would this be comprised of well uh, the, we would have probably an agency right. inside the the homeland security right. in group and then they would they contract would. out to staff okay. it okay. it could be they would probably go out to bid it could be it could be one like of the an, labs almost like an independent auditing agency that would go yes. out and evaluate each project to you know, double check and right. the work of the, of, of the an outside the, review okay, process, I, I, peer review type of thing. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you, okay. uh, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you very much for being here, Ms. Woolsey. Again, right, appreciate you. your testimony. Uh, it appears that our final witness is our friend from Tennessee, Mr. Womp. This committee convened uh, eight and a half hours ago, and uh, we took uh, obviously. Uh, lengthy break for the floor proceedings dealing with uh, the uh, issue with Mr. Trafficant, but we're happy to be back, and we've had a uh, very, very full and rigorous explanation. They and say in Tennessee, I get your drift, Mr. Chairman. Did you bring breakfast? <clears throat> I understand clearly, you and I wasn't going to speak, Mr. Chairman, but I understand the distinguished majority leader mentioned my amendment a few minutes ago, and I felt compelled to come and at least share briefly uh, what it entails. The bill that the select committee has submitted says that within one year of the date of enactment, uh, the, sec the secretary may establish university-based centers or uh, center or centers for homeland security. The bill establishes 15 criteria that would be used to select those university-based centers. Uh, my amendment simply adds one more criterion that could be used when the secretary establishes where these university-based centers uh, may exist. And my amendment says that that 16th criterion would possibly say uh, university-based centers that have an affiliation with a Department of Energy facility. Now, this past Monday, the president went to Argonne National Laboratory and laid out the role that the national laboratories will play in homeland security. I have to tell you, Mr. Chairman, because you and I both share a, uh, an appreciation for Speaker Newt Gingrich. In 1995, I went to Timken Research with him in Canton, Ohio, and Tim Timken said, who went to MIT, Mr. Speaker, if you carry one thing away from here, it is that our best and brightest ideas at Timken Research, which invented the tapered roller bearing, which is in every landing gear of airplanes in the world, he said it's that the best and brightest ideas don't come from our 50-year employees. They come straight from our universities. He said MIT, but he's kind of biased. But they come from our universities. So the bill is on the right track here with university-based research tied into Homeland Security. But we have to use the ones connected to our national laboratories. I represent the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I fought like heck after Speaker Gingrich gave me these ideas to ensure that the University of Tennessee manages with Battelle the Oak Ridge National Laboratory to tie in academia and university-based research with our national laboratories so that we capitalize on the synergy created. So the amendment simply says that that would be one of the criteria. And in closing, pathogen detection airline safety research, forensic analysis, robotics, energy security, bioterrorism, sensors, transportation infrastructure. Those are just a few things that are done at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and at our multi-purpose laboratories across the Department of Energy complex. University-based research needs to be connected to those as well. I'm not saying that this is a mandatory requirement. I'm saying add it, please, as the 16th uh, criteria, a criterion that could be used for the secretary. And I understand the distinguished majority leader said he was willing to work with me at conference, but uh, I had hoped as the co-chairman of the Department of Energy Facilities Caucus that it wouldn't come to this, that we could have the amendment uh, offered and accepted, which I thought we had agreed. But uh, nonetheless, I want to come and make my case. This is important. It needs right. to be connected. And frankly, I feel like I'm doing the president's work based on his speech on Monday. Was well, very good and very helpful testimony. Let me just uh, say, I suspect that you got some interpretation of what it was uh, that uh, that took place up here in the discussion. And uh, while it's true, the uh, the chairman of the committee, the majority leader, did not um, advocate uh, the inclusion of the amendment. He did say that he wanted to work closely with you through the process 
through the conference and dealing with this in response to question on. So I'm I just wanted you, for that. I just wanted to to make that clear, uh, and uh, it's been very thoughtful testimony that you've offered, Mr. Hastings. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, uh, Zach, and I have talked about that this evening. I, I too have a national lab, although their emphasis is on other areas, environment uh, more than uh, national security. Although they do they do, they do, do some work uh, in that. And I would just uh, concur with what sh uh, you say with uh, the work that the national labs do. And I think if you can tie that together, in fact, Washington State University has a branch campus uh, in, uh, in my area, and they work very closely with PNNL. So uh, it is something that ought to be pursued, and I, uh, I congratulate you for that bringing that to us. Mr. Frost. No questions. Mrs. Myrick. Mr. McGovern. I think, it's, I think it's a good idea, and I, I agree you, with you. I mean, I think some of the some of the best ideas that we're going to get are going to come from the university community, and I hope that there's a an aggressive effort at every level to try to uh, hook up with some of these universities. And you probably share the MIT bias. That, uh, well, I do, but MIT is not technically in my district. I have a whole bunch of other colleges in my <laughs> yeah, district, exactly. so and but you probably I, still I have an amendment MIT to make bias. sure that they get tied into this too. No, I'm just teasing. Exactly. But, uh, but I think, but I, I, I really, you know, I, I, I should. It was kind of a little bit off the subject, but since it's so late, what, what difference does it make, right? But I, I have a Worcester Polytechnic Institute in, in, um, in my district, and, uh, and they're actually doing some really incredible research with the Defense Department, uh, mm -hmm. developing an untethered uh, health care center, trying to come up with devices that would better, uh, a lot better able us to monitor the health and well-being of our soldiers in the, in the, in the, in the field of battle. And uh, you know, I think making those connections at every single level uh, is very, very important. So I think you got a good idea. Thank you very much. Mr. Reynolds? Mr. Womp, thank you very much for being here. Never we felt it. better about being turned down in my life, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. Well, thank, thank you. you very much for, <laughs> for joining us, and uh, we're going to work through the night. Thank on you this. for your courtesy. Always great to see you. You, you know too, that. Mr. Chairman. You know that. Uh, that concludes the hearing portion for HR 5005. Let me say, as I, uh, as I said a few minutes ago, it was uh, we're approaching nine hours ago that we convened this hearing, and I appreciate the uh, diligence of our membership. Uh, Mr. Frost and I have discussed the fact that we are uh, in the midst of trying to work out a uh, bipartisan compromise, and uh, we are at this juncture going to plan to uh, convene sometime uh, later this evening, and I know it is after midnight, and I know that we often try if we go past 10 p.m. to convene early the next morning, but since we're still working on the floor and it's well past 10 p.m., I can't tell you um, exactly what time it will be, and it'll be based on the, um, the discussions that are ongoing right now between the speaker and the minority leader. And just as soon as we possibly can, we will uh, have the rule crafted to, again, as I said earlier, allow a free-flowing debate with, um, and I know from having worked on it earlier this evening, that we will be considering most all of the issues that have been uh, raised here, and uh, I think will provide a great opportunity for our members to participate in this very historic effort to establish a Department of Homeland Security. Mr. Frost. Mr. Chairman, um, <clears throat> when will the committee be taking up the conference report on the accounting standards? I'm happy to say that uh, unanimous consent has just uh, been struck agreement uh, between the minority and the majority. It will not be necessary. And so it will not be necessary for this committee to hear and structure a, a rule. We'll be presenting that rule, which basically will be the mm -hmm. standard conference report rule, simply waiving points of order and an hour of debate mm -hmm. on the conference report uh, itself. And uh, I think it's a very good bipartisan work product of which we can all be. Uh, mm -hmm. Extremely proud. Mr. Chairman, uh, could I suggest it's uh, 20 till uh, 1. Mm -hmm. If uh, the uh, collective leadership of both sides cannot uh, reach an agreement, uh, by 1.30 that it might be appropriate well, I'm not gonna, for us to yeah. come back in the morning. Yeah, I mean, let, let me at this point, I don't know when we're going to be voting on the floor. I don't want to make a statement that if we don't have an agreement by 1.30 that we're going to uh, to stop and... Uh, well, are we definitely going back. to have but additional floor votes uh, this evening? Well, I think it's, we, we do have... Uh, Mrs. Myrick has just said we're anticipating another floor vote in about 20 <laughs> minutes or so. And so I, I just I, I don't want to say that if we don't have an agreement by 1:30 that we're not going to going to uh, proceed. I 
I think members should understand that we are hoping to complete the work before we go on our Well, we certainly want break. that to happen. Yes, and we want, we, want, we want it to complete. I would like very much to get some sleep this evening, just mm -hmm. as I know my friend mm -hmm. from Texas would, and maybe even some other members of this committee would. But uh, mm -hmm. um, if, if we, uh, but I'm not going to establish any date or time that we're going to absolutely say we're not going to meet. But we'll try to take all the concerns members have into consideration. Mr. Hastings. Uh, Mr. Chairman, since we are going to be on the floor, it would probably be prudent for us to stay until at least uh, that last vote. But I would just remind you, since you and I are from the West Coast, it's only 20 minutes to 10 <laughs> in that time zone. So we still have plenty of time. No, that's right. Well, the gentleman and I always have plenty of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, regardless of what time it is, if it's 5 o'clock in the morning, that means it's only 2 a.m. in California. So mm -hmm. we will be uh, raring to go, and we want to get this, um, get this very important work completed so that members can proceed with their important plans for August. And we obviously will take all of the concerns that members have um, into consideration. So with that, the committee stands in recess subject to the call of the chair. Thank you all. So there's our live coverage from the House Rules Committee as they met on the rules for debate for the Homeland Security Act of 2002. That legislation is expected to be brought up in the U.S. House tomorrow. You can see live coverage starting at 10 a.m. Eastern. It's on our companion network, C-SPAN. And now here on C-SPAN 2, we'll go back to the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee as they held a markup session for the Homeland Security Department legislation. Connecticut Senator Joseph Lieberman chairs the markup. Well,